Hey, hey, Josh Morgaman here, also known as Hurricane Man, also known as the Chaser Dude. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are on the globe. Uh, and if you're in the United Kingdom, Ireland, or Europe, <laughs> I'm sorry. I know this is a crazy time of day for a live stream. Uh, thank you for staying up for me. Actually, thanks to everybody for making it on this maiden voyage of my new live stream, iCyclone Live. I'm excited to be doing this. I'm psyched you're here. I've been thinking about this for a while. You guys, and I mean the ones who've been following me for years on social media and before that, the message boards, you guys are important to me. I don't know if I say that enough, but your family, like my weather nerd family, as you guys know, I'm kind of a lone wolf. You know, I've spent most of my career, not all of it, but most of it, hunting down dangerous storms all over the globe by myself. It's just always how I've been. I've been kind of like a solo act. And when I'm on these dangerous expeditions alone, a lot of times the only company I have is you guys. And that means a lot to me. It gives me a lot of strength. I know that you guys are looking out for me. I know you have my back. I know you worry about me when I disappear after a really bad storm. And when I come back afterwards to all those like nice comments and questions, I feel really bad if I don't get to respond to everyone. I want to be more responsive. I want to be more kind of there for you. And that's why I started this live stream. It's a way for us to kind of be closer and interact more. It's a way for me to, uh, you know, just tell you what I'm thinking, what I'm planning, where I'm going, and most importantly, what might be threatening you if you live in a hurricane zone in the United States or a typhoon zone or anywhere that's threatened by tropical cyclones. And I could do it here. I could I could talk in more detail than I can in a tweet or when I have some TV producer telling me that I have to say it all in five seconds. The coolest thing of all is that we could have a conversation. So you can see right there, there's a uh, there's that chat feature. You can just ask questions there and I can get around to answering them as I'm talking. Now, I want to be clear that uh, this is not a talk show. I'm not trying to be the weather nerd version of Oprah, but I will occasionally have a buddy on the show, someone who I deem cool enough to be uh, in the iCyclone Live universe. I'll do these regularly. Uh, how regularly? I haven't decided yet. Uh, it just kind of depends, I guess, on the response and how much people enjoy them. This live stream will be between about an hour, an hour and a half uh, between the content that I want to show you and also just uh, answering questions from you guys. And I want to make clear this live stream is brought to you in partnership with Dell Tech Homes. I'm working with them as a brand ambassador, and I'm going to tell you more about them in a little while. All right, with that, let's jump right in. And I think uh, the thing we have to start with tonight, of course, is what I call the breaking snooze, or I, I shouldn't say that, I shouldn't be a wise guy, but the breaking news of the thing in the Gulf. Uh, yeah, this is like kind of took stole the headlines today. Uh, the computer models have been showing this for days, some kind of thing in the Gulf of Mexico, and there it is. And uh, as you guys who follow me know, uh, it's not my cup of tea as a tropical cyclone. It's what I call scrambled eggs. It's a mess. And I don't think that this thing is going anywhere in terms of intensity, but it is becoming a feature and it is becoming something that we have to worry about. Now, a couple of days ago, the intensity models with this thing were showing that uh, it might become a hurricane, especially the ship's model was showing it was going to get up to Cat 2. But since then, they flatlined and they don't even show it becoming a tropical storm. Now, it probably will become a tropical storm, but probably not a very strong one. Despite that, this thing is going to have impacts. Uh, here's the forecast rain totals, and the orange color is over eight inches. And you can see that parts of southeast Louisiana and southern Mississippi are going to get some very heavy rain. Now, the problem is that these areas, a lot of them have already gotten a lot of heavy rain, and the ground is saturated, and it's going to create problems, unfortunately. And for that reason, a large area is under a risk of flash flooding from southeast Louisiana across southern Mississippi and then southwest Alabama. And then there's a risk of storm surge. Now, before I lived in Mississippi, I would uh, I would laugh at the idea of two feet of storm surge or three feet. Like, who cares? Like, who does that impact? Well, it impacts places like Mississippi. I didn't understand this until I lived there. So check this out. This is Beach Boulevard in downtown Bay St. Louis on a normal day, okay? And here's what it looks like when you have a weak tropical storm 400 miles away. Check that out. The whole road is underwater. We go from that to that because Tropical Storm Beta was coming ashore in Matagorda Bay in Texas, 400 miles away. And the point is this part of the world, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, the terrain is incredibly low and incredibly flat. 
I mean, if you look at the coastline around here uh, in a funny way, it floods. So this is something that you guys are going to be dealing with for the next couple of days. I don't think this is going to be a wind maker, but I think it's going to be something to uh, worry about. And I think it's going to have impacts. And I think you have to be careful about it, even if I rag on it and say it's a junk storm, which it is. All right. I'm just checking the comments here. Um, Yep. Uh, Justo Garcia says this is Camille and Katrina turf. Absolutely. That's uh, Bay St. Louis. That Those are the two defining hurricanes in uh, in that town's history. And they're ones uh, that Hurricane House, where I live, has survived, both of them. Uh, yeah, I'm just reading these comments here lots, actually. Uh, my friend, Eric Serena Tribaldo, which actually Eric is my chase partner sometimes in Mexico. Like I don't always chase alone. And when I chase someone, with, when I chase with someone in Mexico, it's with Eric. Eric is my buddy and Eric and I have been through a couple of really dangerous storms together, including Hurricane Patricia. Eric and I were scrant, were uh, squeezed into a little tiny bathroom at, at, at a hotel as the whole building blew apart in Patricia's eye wall. And uh, Eric and I also drove into the eye wall of Category, thro category 3 Willa in Sinaloa uh, in 2018. Eric and I are buddies. And yeah, he likes to tease me. If I don't give enough love to the EPAC or the Eastern Pacific, he is on my, he's on my ass about it. Uh Maverick asks, am I going to chase uh, this thing in the Gulf? No, I'm not going to chase it. It's a good question. My cutoff point is hurricanes. I like to chase hurricanes. If it's not a hurricane, eh, it's not my cup of tea. As long as it's a category one, as long as I can call it a hurricane, I'm interested. But this thing, I don't think it's going to become a hurricane. Now, if it does and I miss it, I'll be very, very annoyed. But uh, let's see. Cool Gamer asks, am I ever going to chase in New Jersey? It's a good question. I'm going to talk in a little more detail about this later, about where I like to chase. So I grew up on Long Island, New York. You know, I grew up in the Northeast where we get hurricanes, but they're a different kind of hurricane. Storms that come up there are starting to weaken and they're starting to transition. They don't have what I call the sexy tight cores that you, no, sorry to sound like a pervert about it, but that's what I think of them as. The sexy tight inner cores that you get in the hurricanes down in the Gulf. Um, those are the ones that uh, that really make me very interested, uh, you know, scientifically. Once they get up to the Northeast, they're not as much like that. And so um, I generally don't plan to chase in the Northeast. However, I did grow up on Long Island and I've got kind of like, I guess, a soft spot for the hurricanes up there just from a nostalgic perspective. So maybe I will get up there and chase one. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Uh, the support always means something to me. Thank you. Thank you, C, whoever that is. I uh, appreciate the support very much. Elliot Liswan is from Cancun. Yeah, uh, so you're from the Yucatan. So last year was very rough in the Yucatan. You guys, you had Delta and Zeta, and you also had Gamma. You guys had three hurricanes. That was crazy. Three hurricane impacts on the Yucatan. It was nuts. And I was there for two of them. And I would say the worst in Cancun is probably Delta. All right, I'm going to get back to the presentation here. And the next thing we're going to talk about is 2020. A lot of folks want to kind of hear uh, my tale of what happened. And I'm just going to kind of give you a high level review of what it was like. So I started 2020 feeling like I was on top of the world. This is my attitude on March 1st of last year. I just, I had like, a, you know, I had a speaking tour lined up across the Midwest and the South. I was going to be, I had a couple of TV gigs in the pipeline. I was going to chase in some faraway lands that I hadn't been to. I mean, big plans. I was going to conquer the world. And then this happened. And of course, it changed all our lives. And for me, what it did was it made my world very small. So this is where I was going to chase in 2020. This was like what I considered my kingdom, my theater, where I was going to hunt down. And it shrank from that to that. With international travel shut down, it looked like basically I was going to be stuck chasing in an extremely, for me, an extremely small area, basically just the Gulf of Mexico and Southeast US. And I started thinking about it. And I'm like, okay. I plotted the furthest west, south, and east points where I believed that I'd be chasing. And when I uh, sort of looked at those, I said, okay, I don't want to be getting on planes because of the whole COVID thing. I want to be able to drive to everything. What's a midpoint between all those places? What's a point from which I can drive to all those places in the same amount of time? And that was Mississippi. 
And I was excited about that. And that's when I decided that I was going to live in Mississippi for five months. And it made sense. Why would I stay in LA? LA makes sense if I'm going to be going to East Asia to hunt down typhoons also. But with East Asia all closed up and shut down because of COVID and me being stuck in North America, I figured I might as well live in the heart of the USA's hurricane country. And that's what I did. So I started looking for places and I settled on this house, hurricane house in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. In this house, uh, it really, I'm kind of a history nerd, and I was into the the fact that this house is a century old, and it's been through some of the greatest hurricanes in American history. This little house went through the eye of Category 5 Hurricane Camille, literally went right through the eye when it had sustained winds of 175 miles an hour. And it also went through Hurricane Katrina, which produced a 30-foot storm surge in and around St. Louis Bay, probably the highest storm surge in American history. That surge came up to the porch steps there. So this house has seen it all. And uh, in fact, her, uh, Mississippi has a very rich and storied hurricane history. Some of the greatest in American history have hit it, even though the Mississippi coastline, if you look on a map, is actually quite small. And you can see, look at the purple track, that's Camille, Category 5 Camille, and you can see it basically passed right over Bay St. Louis. So I was excited about my new digs. And I settled in. This uh, front porch of the house became my basically my favorite place on the planet. And I settled into... Um, I settled into life in Mississippi. Now, as a lot of you guys know, I'm a I'm a city guy. I was born in New York City. I grew up around there and I went to school in Boston and I live in LA. I never in my entire life lived in a small town. And I'll tell you, man, there was no adjusting. I was into it right off the bat. I loved it. <laughs> it's like there's something about the small town life, just just having like the the quiet, this the space to think and breathe, and just everything being easier. I really took to it, and I developed or Bay St. Louis kind of burrowed into my heart to a very special place, and uh, I was really loving being there. And uh, the the local media didn't hurt. Uh, this is the Biloxi Sun Herald. This is the main newspaper for Southern Mississippi. They did a lot of stories on me. And this is the front page from September 11th. Uh, the story was that I was watching the Gulf waiting for hurricanes. I was really into that. I wish the, uh, I wish the LA Times would treat me so well. But I have a confession to make. So I talked about how at the beginning of 2020, I felt like I was just ready to conquer the world. And that's true. But another side of me was feeling really burned out. And I don't like to talk about this stuff. I'm kind of old fashioned. I'm like, I'm not one of these people who likes to share his like feelings or vulnerabilities online. But going into 2020, I was feeling burned out. I've been going for years hunting cyclones around the earth. And it was just the buildup of all those 14 hour flights and going to foreign countries and chasing down hurricanes in places where like, I, you know, I don't speak the language and, and uh, you know, and I don't know where I am and just then being trapped places for days and just, just the craziness of that lifestyle. As much as I treasure that level of sort of just insanity, you know, I, I, I kind of feed on that sort of adrenaline as much as I'm really into that. Um, it just kind of started to wear me out. And I, as much as I was ready to conquer the world last year, a side of me was just almost dreading it like a tennis player who does too many tournaments. And I was starting to feel like, gosh, like maybe I just need a break from this. So it was in a sense, almost like fate that COVID happened because it just, it made me, it gave me a different approach to things. And what ended up happening was that living and chasing on the Gulf coast was the change that I needed because it totally changed the way I chase it made things simpler and more spontaneous. You know, when you're chasing around the globe, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's airline tickets and airports and rental cars and language barriers. Instead, I was just hanging out on this house in this house on the Mississippi coast, you know, and if I felt like chasing something, I just kind of watched it. And then when I decided to chase it, I just threw some stuff in the car and just got in the car and drove a few hours. It just, everything became so simple and spontaneous. And I was really into that without all the airline, just an airport nonsense. The other thing is I felt more connected. When I'm in LA, everything is through the computer models. I'm following everything on computer models, and then I fly somewhere to chase. When I'm living on the Gulf Coast, you're, you're of course, I'm still looking at computer models, but I'm also just going to the shoreline every day and just looking at the sky and the ocean and kind of seeing, okay, what is the Gulf going to bring to me today? You feel very connected to it. And the other thing is I was having a more complete experience, not just going into this uh, place for the hurricane and then leaving, but experiencing sort of the 
the rhythm of a season uh, along the Gulf Coast. You know, the, the, it, I, what I noticed was we had all these threats and it was like waves. The threats would come and go, almost like waves of COVID. You know, the threat would come, the townspeople would talk about it, then it would go away. Then it would, a new threat would come and it would go away. And I kind of got really into that rhythm. It was just a totally different way of experiencing this. So what I expected to be a lost year ended up being really a very cool year. And I'm not making light of COVID. It was a horrible year for everybody. But, you know, I very much believe that, you know, you do what you can to kind of make, you know, you just take the circumstances you have and you just try to make them good. Okay. So that's what I was doing. Next, we'll talk about the hurricanes last year. And I'm just checking the comments here and questions. Uh, Justo Garcia is talking about uh, Camille's barometric pressure. Uh, yep, it was lowered to 900. Yes, that's correct. Camille was reanalyzed. I think I agree with the new official sort of uh, intensity of Camille. Violet, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, I was debating whether I was going to share that, you know, that kind of like my inner feelings, that stuff. I usually, I don't go there usually about that stuff publicly, but uh, I just felt like, I, you know, I wanted to share it here on live stream just to kind of make more of a connection with you guys, let you know what's really going on inside my head. Uh, Chris Jarris, thank you so much for the super chat. Do I listen to special songs to get pumped when I'm storm chasing? Absolutely. Uh, I, I like the, uh, the rock group Heart. I like Old Heart. I like listening to Barracuda and Magic Man and I actually maybe even some of the stuff from the 80s. But yeah, actually, and, and any any 80s metal I'm really into. You know, I'll listen to like Motley Crue or a Cinderella, stuff like that. But that's a, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Yeah, I would say music is a really big part of Music's a really big part of my uh, of my chase experience. Uh, Aaron Green asks, in my opinion, what was the most impressive scientific aspects of hurricanes? Um, the, to me, the thing that that makes hurricanes most interesting and and uh, what what gives them sort of a unique quality, in my opinion, is the is the hurricane's eye. Okay, that's like that to me is the really that's the thing where I, I really that makes it just its own. There's no sort of feature like that in the atmosphere that is so unique where there's just this, this dead spot surrounded by the most stormy part of the storm. I think that's a, or the most violent part of the storm. I think that that's something that I really, I really dig. Uh, C asked, do I have a favorite chase of all time and the scariest? Uh, that's a great question. And I would say uh, for both of those, it would be Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. It was the strongest hurricane I was in, actually the strongest on record to hit North America. And uh, it was scary. And it was also my favorite chase. And I don't mean favorite like uh, like that it was, uh, you know, I enjoyed it, but favorite in the sense of scientifically meaningful because I collected some really cool data in it. Uh, Daniel Lewis, thank you very much for the super chat. I uh, really appreciate the support from everybody. And uh, Aaron Green, I wanted to also not just acknowledge your question, but thank you for the super chat as well. All right, I'm gonna, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of questions here. I apologize, there's a lot here and I'm kind of, I'm learning the ropes here in terms of how to do a live stream. And, and I'm realizing there's a lot of kind of multitasking. I'm sort of running the show and reading the comments. In the future, if this show starts to take off, I think what I might do is I will actually have someone maybe helping me and bringing the coolest questions to the forefront so I can, uh, so I can answer them. All right, I think we'll go on from there. Actually, one more question from Heather Perry. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that, Heather. I'm glad that you liked that video. All right. So now let's talk about the hurricanes last year. So uh, it was a it was a busy season in the United States. Uh, just well, it was a busy season in the Atlantic. Thirty named storms, which was a record, and it was also a busy season in the United States. Six hurricanes hit the U.S. and five of them were in the Gulf Coast. It was a very Gulfy kind of year. Now, folks thought it was a record, but it actually wasn't. The Freakazoid 1886 actually has everything beat. That year, seven hurricanes hit the U.S. Gulf Coast, which is nuts. And what was even weirder was that actually uh, three of them struck the coast in June. Okay, we think of June as like super early. Three hurricanes hit the American Gulf Coast in June of 1886 and then another one in July. So it was a very front-loaded season. It was kind of crazy. 
Lindsay Sturman, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the super chat. What got me into hurricanes initially was actually growing up on Long Island and just being in them. You know, and I think for a lot of weather nerds, that's what happens. It's like you you just experience them and they have a kind of magical quality for some of us. And that makes you just want to keep experiencing them. Okay, so let's talk about 2020, why it was not so special. People were going on and on about what a crazy year it was. There are things about it that actually weren't that crazy. Uh, one of them was that the quality of the storms in the North Atlantic was not that great, actually. There were a lot of storms, but a lot of them were total junk storms, like just like sheared, messy, ugly looking things. And the hurricanes that were intense didn't last that long. So it meant that the accumulated cyclone energy or what we call the ACE number was actually not that high. I mean, it was above normal, but it was no record breaker. And it was also quite below average in all of the Pacific. Now we think of the Western Pacific where the, where the typhoons happen. We think of that as the world cyclone factory and it is, but last year it was kind of a snoozer. It wasn't really that, uh, wasn't a whole lot happening. There was a very intense typhoon that hit uh, the Philippines in November, but the rest of the year was kind of dead. Central and Eastern Pacific also, and it was quiet around Australia. But if you were in, if you were in uh, the Gulf Coast, it was it was a bad year. Here's all the landfalls that happened, and you could see they were mostly in the Central and Western Gulf. They're color coded, and you could see that Laura was by far the most intense. And because it was busy on the coast, it was busy for me as a chase season. Uh, I chased six hurricanes, but I had eight penetrations because. Two of those were doubles where I chased the hurricane on the Yucatan Peninsula, penetrated it there, and then rushed back to the U.S. and penetrated it in the U.S. So there were two doubles there. And the first of those was Hurricane Delta. You could see I got it in Cancun and then flew back to the U.S. and then quickly got to Louisiana and got it in Louisiana. And then two weeks later, it was the weirdest thing. It was like deja vu. It's like Groundhog Day. I was doing the same thing with Hurricane Zeta. I got it on the Yucatan and then got it on the middle Gulf Coast. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. All right. I'm not going to do a chronological walkthrough of last year's hurricanes. That would take about four hours, but I am going to kind of hit the highlights. And I thought I would do it by giving awards. And because I'm a nice guy, every hurricane gets a trophy. Well, actually, I think one of them doesn't, but uh, we'll see. All right. I'll go back to comments here or questions. There's a lot. And like I said, I'm kind of learning how to multitask here. Pam asks, after Haiyan and Mark's injury, do you carry a first aid kit with you? And if so, have you used it? Great question. So just for folks who don't know, Super Typhoon Haiyan was a uh, category five that smashed a city in the Philippines. I was there with my good buddy, James Reynolds, and also another dude, Mark Thomas. And in the height of the storm, we were rescuing people. We were jumping in the water, the storm surge to pull people out. And Mark, uh, Mark's leg hit some debris under the water and his leg was ripped open. And it was so, it got so infected that by the time he got back to Taiwan, he's British, but his wife is Taiwanese and he lives in Taiwan. By the time he got back to Taiwan, his leg was so infected that it, the doctor basically said to him, if it went another day, they would have had to have amputated it. So given that, Pam, I'm embarrassed to say that I do not carry a first aid kit and <laughs> there's no excuse. And actually the fact that you've publicly asked me this is it's a sign uh, that the universe is telling me that I need to I need to make this right. So Pam, because you asked that question, I am gonna start carrying a first aid kit. Thank you for reminding me to not be stupid. So let's see what other questions here. There's just so many good questions, and I'm having trouble keeping up with all of them. And I'm sure I'm missing really good ones, and I feel really uh, I feel really bad about it. Uh, but uh, hopefully, I can get back to some of them later when I read the, over them. Andrew asks, if I could have chased any storm last year uh, that I couldn't because of COVID, which would I have chased? Oh, for sure. That's an easy one. Great question. I would have chased Super Typhoon Goni. That was the one I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. That was the one in the Philippines that was a Category 5. Now, there's a chance that Goni was the strongest landfalling tropical cyclone in world history. The official intensity estimate, well, the operational and intensity estimate at landfall was 170 knots, which is 195 miles an hour. Now, the Joint Typhoon Warning Center is still doing the postseason analysis on that. And a lot of times in postseason analysis, they'll adjust the numbers. But if they leave that number as it is, then Goni was actually even stronger than Super Typhoon Haiyan, so meaning it would have broken that record. So we're going to see what happens. But that was an historic storm, and I wish that I could have chased that. So, yeah, great question. Thank you, Andrew. All right. 2020 Hurricane Awards. Are you in suspense? I am. 
All right, let's go. All right, first one, sexiest hurricane. Which do you think it is? I think I'm I think I'm gonna get some heat for this one. I think that I think that the hardcore weather nerds are not gonna like my choice for this. But the sexiest hurricane, okay. Oh, by the way, this is only US hurricanes. I want to make that clear. It's US hurricanes. All right, the sexiest US hurricane was Hurricane Hannah in Port Mansfield, Texas. Okay, now a lot of you are probably shocked, like, okay, why would I pick a category one hurricane? Huh? Well, a defining characteristic of the hurricanes that hit the U.S. last year was that they were all very ugly and deformed. Even though even the strong and destructive ones, just they did not look good. They were they were ugly storms. They were all malformed. Laura was the exception. Laura was a, a nicely formed storm, but the rest of them looked like complete garbage. Hannah was the only one that looked good, even though it was a Category One. Now let me show you. Uh, this is the track of Hannah across the Gulf. You could see it just kind of wobbled into South Texas. The red line is where I chased it. You could see I just drove along the Gulf Coast and then got under it. This is a radar shot just before I drove into the eye wall. And you could see that's a, that's a nicely formed eye and eye wall. And here's a further view of it. That's a gorgeous hurricane. I mean, it's a Category 1. It's an 80 knot Category 1. But that is a textbook classic hurricane. I remember looking at this radar and just being like, wow, it's got a very nice symmetric basically closed eye wall and nice spiral feeder bands. That's a good looking storm. I was just like, wow, I was really impressed with that for category one, especially. This is a cool radar shot. This is as I was in Port Mansfield going, kind of skimming along this Southern part of the calm eye. Here's a very douchey selfie that I took in the calm eye. I was celebrating because this was my 50th hurricane eye wall and I was just, I guess, showing off a little. Here's some less douchey life forms, a little deer. There's a lot of deer that live in and around Port Mansfield. And they, were, they came out to play during the eye. It was really, it was really cool. All right. Next up, most embarrassing. So folks who follow my chasing, and, and a lot of you do, um, you probably know which one I'm talking about. But hey, I'll just, uh, I'll, 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 I'll spill the beans. Hurricane Isaias in North Carolina. So what made this, why was this storm, why was this embarrassing? It was an embarrassing chase because I drove thousands of miles for a raggedy category one hurricane and I got faked out and the whole thing was just like, I hated it. So you could see the red line is where I drove. So I drove along the Gulf Coast and down the Florida Peninsula because I first thought it was going to hit West Palm Beach or that area. And you could see as the hurricane approached, it weakened. The green means it weakened to a tropical storm. And also it kind of whiffed. It missed South Florida. So I felt totally faked out. It was the first time I'd busted in like four years and I was just pissed. And I was about to go home to Mississippi. But then I was like, hmm, this thing might have a second life up in the Carolinas. So I drove up the Florida Peninsula. I slept the night in Jacksonville just to kind of think about it. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to go for this thing. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to get my notch on the bedpost from this thing. And then I drove along the coast and I finally intercepted it. And I got in the eye in uh, Ocean Isle Beach in North Carolina. It was not an amazing hurricane. It was it's not particularly impressive, but it was cool to at least just kind of seize victory from, from uh, defeat. Where I was, it wasn't so strong, but actually in the community south of Wilmington, which were in that right eye wall, they actually got raked pretty good. It was not a bad hurricane from the folks I talked to who were in it. All right, biggest surprise of the year. What do you think this one is? This is very subjective, but for me, the one that surprised me the most as I was chasing it was Hurricane Sally in Gulf Shores, Alabama. So what made it surprising? This. Okay, so the afternoon that I was chasing it, this is what it looked like on radar. It was just a big old mess. This is what I call scrambled eggs. It just, it was a mess. I didn't even think it was going to come ashore as a hurricane. It was just not coming together. I was literally thinking of just like going home to Mississippi, just getting in the car and leaving because I, I don't chase rainstorms. It's not my cup of tea. Okay, but cut to nine hours later and look how much it changed. Bam. Notice how it goes from this very scrambled eggs look to just, you got that nice, intense, consolidated eye wall. All of a sudden, boom. And that was the thing about Sally. All the intensification happened right before landfall. And that's the forecaster's biggest fear is that rapid intensification just as a hurricane is coming offshore because it catches folks off guard. And in this case, it caught me off guard. Now, despite how hot that northern eye wall looks, it's still a pretty deformed hurricane. Look at that. This southern eye wall, there isn't a southern eye wall. The whole southern half of that thing, it's what I call a half a cane. And again, Sally, it was a really interesting and kind of a strong hurricane, but it was pretty deformed, actually. Uh, you know, it just it really was a half of a storm. But 
it was a surprise and it came ashore uh here you could see that northern iowa approaching gulf shores and then bam it hit us good and uh, here is what that was like on the ground. Now, keep in mind, I was not expecting this thing to come ashore as a hurricane. I literally thought it was gonna be a tropical storm. So I was just out in my car, just kind of basically playing with fire. And then it hit, and as you could see, it was a, it was a pretty decent hurricane. All right, yeah, that was a that was a pretty pretty good hurricane for when I didn't expect it to be a hurricane. A couple of questions uh, from Shark: Why did you need to join a uh, Reed Timmer in wading through storm surge? Uh, I have actually not chased with Reed, so I think you might be thinking of someone else. Uh, Reed is a good friend of mine, though. I, I Reed is an awesome dude, and I I love Reed's chasing. He chases with so much passion. But since, as you guys know, I'm kind of a solo act, I'm pretty much usually on my own couple of other interesting questions I saw here, which I wanted to uh, answer. Uh, actually, um, one person asked me, um, I can't find it right here. Let me, uh, someone asked, I wanted to bring up the question because I thought it was a really good one. Um, someone asked what I thought was the, uh, was the most hurricane prone state. And that's easy. That's Florida without a doubt. Florida is the Florida is absolutely just, it. when you look at a map, it's just this peninsula sticking out into the water, asking to be smashed by hurricanes. Now, Florida hurricane history is very up and down. What you notice when you look over over time at um, at various kind of patterns with hurricanes is that years, or various years or decades will have um, will have sort of you'll notice that the that the storms cluster in certain places. So, for example, one year it might be the Gulf of Mexico, next year it's the East Coast, and you'll have decades like that too. So, late '40s, right after World War II, okay, Florida had five category four hurricanes in a six year period. Think about that. One hit Miami, one hit Fort Lauderdale, nuts. And then Florida can go 20 years without a major hurricane. It's very up and down, but statistically over time, Florida absolutely wins. Florida is the most hurricane prone state by far. It is it is definitely the king of, of hurricanes. And uh, or, yeah, it absolutely is. It's like, it's, uh, it's a place. All right, so let's move on. Okay, the next award, scientifically sexiest. Okay, as you guys know, I'm very into, you know, I talk a lot about being like an adrenaline junkie, and I absolutely am, but I, sorry, I have a little technical problem here. There we go. I wanted to bring myself back because I knew you were missing my face. Uh, so, I, you know, I am an adrenaline junkie, and of course, it's a big part of why I chase. But over the years, something that's become very important to me is collecting meaningful scientific data inside hurricanes. And that's actually my biggest thrill now, especially when the hurricane is coming ashore somewhere where there are no weather station. Maybe there, there aren't any recon planes in it, meaning there's going to be no record of what happened in this thing unless I'm there with my instruments. And that's what really gets me excited. In fact, there was a hurricane... Uh, Willa in Sinaloa, Mexico, the one I chased with my friend Eric uh, back in 2018. That was one where um, there there were no there was no data from that thing except what I collected, and that helped the Hurricane Center put their report together because they had some ground data from me. All right, scientifically sexiest hurricane. What do you guys think? Sally again. 
I collected really cool data in Sally. Here's Sally's track. You can see it just wobbled ashore in extreme southeast uh, Alabama. And you can see this, that purple and red dots are where I was and where my instruments were about a mile apart. And here's the data that I collected in Sally. I had 968 millibars in the eye, uh, which is pretty much what you'd expect in a category two. But if you zoom in, check out all the cool, interesting stuff happening with this data. First of all, Look at that jagged, that crazy jagged uh, pressure trace in the transition from the eye wall to the eye. Okay, there is some definite mesovortex action happening there. Those are the fingerprints of, meso, of mesovortices when you have that kind of jagged thing going on. And I've noticed that a lot of time you get that craziness in the inner, inner part of the eye wall as you're transitioning into the calm eye. I've noticed this in many hurricanes that sometimes the very fiercest winds, the most crazy and explosive gusts happen uh, just as you're kind of transitioning into the calm eye. The other thing is check out this steep gradient. Look how sharply the pressure falls between 2 and 3 a.m. Now, because I knew the forward speed of the of the hurricane, I can use the pressure change over time to calculate the, uh, the pressure gradient. And in Sally, it was 6.4 millibars per nautical mile. Now, just, I know I'm nerding out a little, uh, pressure change or gradient is pressure change over distance. The greater the gradient, the greater the pressure change over a given distance, the more violent and explosive the winds. So it matters. And I know 6.4 is probably a somewhat abstract number for you, but let me show you how it compares to other hurricanes. These are a bunch of recent big hurricanes in which I collected data and calculated core gradients. <clears throat> and you could see where, where Sally ranks. It's nowhere near nuclear grade Hurricane Dorian, which was over 12, but it's up there with other, <clears throat> with category four hurricanes, which is really impressive. Now I'm not saying that Sally was a category four hurricane. I, it was a strong <clears throat> category two. And I think that the Hurricane Center classified it correctly, but it's interesting that it had such an extreme gradient. All right. What about the nastiest? What do you guys think was the nastiest hurricane of the year? And while I'm waiting for you guys to answer, Michael, thank you very much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the support. Um, how's it going to be for Florida this year? It's hard to say. You know, Florida got off pretty easy last year. The, the extreme northwest tip of Florida got nailed by Sally, but otherwise, uh, Florida Florida got pretty lucky last year. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, it's hard to know, it's hard to predict landfall points before beforehand, but you know, uh, I think that who, who knows if they'll be as lucky this year. Connor, I know, I know global weather updates is my good buddy, Connor in, uh, in the United Kingdom, best looking storm of all time. Oh man. Great question. Great question. Uh, I would, if I'm going to really be a nerd, I'm going to turn the question back to you and say, well, okay, are you talking radar or satellite? Cause that, uh, that plays into it. Um, I know a lot of people say Super Typhoon Haiyan. Uh, I personally uh, was really into Wilma in the Northwest Caribbean at peak uh, intensity. Really kind of <laughs> the look of that thing really excited me. I was really into that. Uh, Haiyan was amazing, obviously. Patricia in the Eastern Pacific, those were you know, another good ones. I think I tend to be maybe a little, you know, it's subjective and I tend to be a little biased toward the uh, maybe the hurricanes that are near North America, although I've obviously seen a couple of beautiful typhoons. Cameron Thompson, which hurricane was the worst experience you've had in your life? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say the one that disturbed me the most was Super Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. That was the one where we were rescuing people from the storm surge. It was a category five that hit a big city head on and the storm surge came in really fast. So fast, it was like a tsunami that it, uh, it killed thousands of people in the city within minutes. That's how fast it came in. And I remember coming out of the hotel afterward and uh, just seeing, you know, bodies in the streets and, and injured children and just, just horrible, horrible stuff. And, uh, you know, I've, I very rarely lost my excitement to chase. And after high end, I did for a little while. Uh, I, there were a few months after high end where I just, um, I was kind of, I, I was just like, I was done with hurricanes for a while. I was just like, I don't want to, I don't want to see them. I don't want to think about them. I mean, cause I was, I was just very upset by what I saw, you know, I'm very, um, 
I get very excited by them meteorologically. It's this awesome spectacle. It's like it's like art from nature. And when you think about it, a hurricane is not it's not bad or good. It is just it is just part of the earth being the earth. It's just it's just earth processes. But we get in the way of them, and then they're tragic. But when you think about it, it's they're they're morally neutral. So there's nothing really bad about hurricanes. But unfortunately, it's like we we stand on the train tracks. But seeing those impacts, it was disturbing to me, and it was disturbing enough that um that you know, I, I really had a hard time getting past it. By the next season I did, and I was able to start chasing again, but I thought I might not for a while. Lois has a great question. Uh, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. How do I cope mentally with the death and destruction experience? It's a great question. And I'll tell you how I did it in Hyann, the one I was just talking about. And actually Hyann is where I learned how to do this. So I do this thing called compartmentalization, where I literally, I just, um, I, I just, I literally divide up my, it's like I divide up my mind and, and, and I decide when I'm allowed to feel emotions. It's almost like I, I picture my brain, like a TV dinner tray where there's different compartments for different things. And during high end, when, when I witnessed the aftermath and also I was just stuck there for days, uh, just witnessing unbelievable human suffering. I realized that the only way I was going to survive that was to just completely shut my emotions off. I had to just wall off my brain and not feel emotions. And I just, yeah, I, I, I can't explain it, but I literally just said, okay, you're not going to feel anything. And I just literally shut down and kind of became this like, almost like task zombie, you know? Um, I, you know, I, I tried to be helpful to people and stuff like that, but I was like, I'm not going to feel anything. When I got back to LA many days later, and I was in a safe space. Then I had emotions. It was funny when I watched the, the news uh, shows about high end, I would cry. I would get very upset. But while I was there, I was just shut down. And I used that skill, that skill of just shutting off my emotions. I used it again in Dorian. Dorian was another in the Bahamas. That was another one that caused unbelievable human suffering. And I was again, trapped there for days. And I was able to just shut my emotions off. Just, you know, I had a car that was functioning. I was able to just, just be helpful to others, uh, you know, not freak out and just, just wait, save the emotions for later. It's okay to feel emotions, but sometimes you don't have time for them, you know, or you, or they're not helpful. Sometimes you just need to just act, you know, just, just check off your task list. That's how I get through things like that. Great question. Thanks for asking. God, so many good questions. I wish I can like just do these all night. All right. So nastiest hurricane, you, you guys have had a lot of chances to guess. The nastiest, I think this is a pretty easy one. I think clearly Hurricane Laura. For the U.S., this was... This was a catastrophic hurricane for the United States. And, and in terms of the hurricanes last year, this one caused the most suffering. This was a big old long tracker. You know, it started way out in the Eastern Atlantic. And something interesting, look at the track of this thing. It passed over the spine of the Greater Antilles over Hispaniola and then over Cuba. Now we think us tropical nerds, we think of those we think of those islands as, as cyclone killers. You know, we think of, you know, Hispaniola is very mountainous and a hurricane or a tropical storm passes over. It just gets like torn to shreds. It's like going into a blender. Usually that's the case, but sometimes you have a cyclone that's just really determined. Okay. It's somehow like it's got some fight and Laura was one of those. And I remember as it passed over the spine of those islands and it just, that circulation just held together. Like Laura was a fighter. I knew that this thing was going to be a big problem once it got into the Gulf because it gave me that vibe. And sure enough, look at it. As soon as it got into the Gulf, it turned into a hurricane. That's what the yellow means. And the warmer colors mean stronger. You could see it turned into a hurricane and then it intense, it rapidly intensified up to landfall in Louisiana. But Laura was just one of those cyclones. That thing was dressed to kill. Here's a close-up shot of the landfall in Southwest Louisiana. The blue line represents where I chased. That was my driving path over a couple of days. And it just shows you how obsessive I get. I call this swamp chase, trying to figure out where I was going to be for Hurricane Laura. And I was going back and forth. It, this, I knew this was going to be a big historic landfall. And I was like, all right, I cannot F this up. I've got to really come through on this. And I scouted a lot of locations. And fortunately, I ended up in the right one. Laura was a hard chase. I call it a triple threat. Okay, I've chased many Category 4s, many, and Category 5s. I've chased many nighttime hurricanes, and I've chased in the Louisiana swamps before. What I have not done is all three of those things at the same time. And that's what made Laura feel really dangerous to me. Here's Laura when it first came into radar range. Check out that core. Even though there's some attenuation because the uh, the eye wall is very far away, that's a mean-looking hurricane. Like, that core is like, yikes. Like, when I saw that, I was like, okay, 
this thing's going to be trouble. And it approached, and this is, I was in Sulphur, Louisiana by this point, and this is as we were entering the eye wall. And here is what that was like on the ground as that passed over us. All right. Yeah, we were getting raked then. A couple of cool questions came in. One uh, from Mike, maybe what's the safest type of building? It's a great question. And it's something I've been learning a lot about. So I used to assume it was just, you know, five foot thick concrete walls, you know, steel door. And I learned uh, in working with Dell Tech Homes, that's actually not necessarily the case. Dell Tech Homes, which are made of wood, uh, resist extremely high winds. And I'm going to talk about that in a little while because I consider Dell Tech Homes among the safest places to be in a hurricane. I'll be talking about that in a little while. Uh, Jonathan asks, uh, can I describe what 185 mile hour winds are like? Uh, great question. <laughs> It was really weird. So I wrote out Hurricane Dorian. And for those of you who don't know, Hurricane Dorian was the uh, strongest hurricane on record to strike North America, tied with the 1935 Labor Day hurricane in Florida. Uh, estimated sustained winds of 185 miles an hour while it passed over Great Obaco Island, where I was. So I wrote it out in a small concrete classroom with 11 other people. And we had cyclone shutters up against the windows. And we could sort of watch through the cyclone shutter slats on the downwind side. Uh, two things about it. One is that when you're in the eye wall of a hurricane like that, you can't see a damn thing. Okay. You just can't see everything just turn white. It was the middle of the day. It was like 12 noon. Everything just turns white. Like stuff that was 10 feet outside the window, you couldn't see. It was like a blizzard. And then when we got in the eye and the white curtain lifted, then it was just, you know, cars thrown all over the place, trees just reduced to sticks. But it was like, you didn't see anything happen because that's how crazy it was. And in terms of the sound, it was a roar. It was just a roar. And the other thing was that when you have 185 mile an hour winds with gusts over 200 miles an hour hitting a building, those wind gusts create all kinds of crazy pressure changes and it kills your ears. Everyone in the room was just like, ah, like, cause you, you feel your eardrums are just going in and out. It was, it's, it's really, a, it's an assault on your senses is the only way I could describe it. It was a, it was a very, it was a very harsh hurricane. Uh, and it was, it was an unbelievable spectacle to behold. And it remains my top chase. All right. Here is a, here's a cool radar shot as the inner eye wall was reaching sulfur and then bam, bullseye got right in the middle of the eye. And I was really excited about that because that's what I really wanted to do in this hurricane because I knew it was going to be important and I'd be able to collect some meaningful data in it. And here's the data that I got. And I was excited by uh, Laura because... I collected data from multiple places. So I, I planted a, a, this green star here, that's Orange, Texas, which was in the left eye wall. I left a device there to record. And then I took a couple of devices with me to Sulphur, which is the pink star. You could see which went right through the center of the eye. And here this chart compares the pressures at the two points. And you could see, of course, the pressure in Sulphur was way lower, about 27 millibars lower than what you had in Orange, Texas. 
just about 20 miles away. Uh, now that's a pretty steep gradient, although I will say not as steep a gradient as I would expect in a hurricane of that strength. I thought that was weird. The, the gradients in Laura were somewhat tepid and I don't know why. Um, another really freaky thing about Laura before we go on, Laura had what I call concentric eyes. So when you got into the eye of Laura, okay, it stopped raining and you could see stars, but the winds were still blowing hurricane force. <laughs> it was really weird. And that happened for a while. And it wasn't until I got right into the exact center of the eye that it actually, we had the dead calm where you could go outside and you could build a card house. And that lowest pressure happened inside the dead calm. But like I said, there was this outer part of the eye that was very windy. And my friends in Lake Charles, a little to the east, they never got in the calm part of the eye. They were in the windy part. My friends in Lake Charles said, yeah, we, we saw stars and the winds were blowing at 100 miles an hour. Totally weird storm. I don't know what was going on with that thing. I'm friends with some of the hurricane hunters who are the military guys who fly the planes into the hurricanes to collect data. And interestingly, they told me that they thought that the hurricane was very weird also, that the data they were collecting and it just, it was structurally kind of, there was something weird about it, but it looked pretty good on radar. All right. Here's the damage around sulfur. Uh, luckily, the town did not get storm surge, but it had a lot of wind damage. You could see along the main commercial drag, every sign blown out or deformed. This is Salvador Dali's take on McDonald's, I guess. A lot of roof damage, uh, debris and trees blocking almost every street. Very heavy damage to industrial and commercial buildings. Uh, just no match for these winds. Destroyed gas stations, ripped open church. Here's the historic old town of Sulphur, and you can see it looks like a war zone, just the place got really, really smashed up. All right, final award of the year, weirdest plot twist. Any guesses? While you guys are guessing, I'll, uh, I'll check and see if there's any. There's so many great questions and comments, and I'm, I'm not getting to all of them, and I feel really bad because I'm just, I want to answer all of these. All these uh, questions are very cool. Actually, I'm getting a lot more questions. I didn't expect so many people to be typing questions and uh, and comments, and uh, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, have I ever witnessed fatalities firsthand? I've not witnessed someone getting killed, but I I mean I've seen bodies, yes, and uh, it's it was after high end, and uh, it was one of the reasons that I don't want to chase for a while. Uh, James, the most powerful storm that I chased was Hurricane Dorian, which is a, the strongest landfalling hurricane uh, on record in North America, 185 mile an hour sustained winds. So yeah. Um, all right. I'm just checking the comments, checking the questions. Yeah. Again, I'm not going to get to all of these awesome questions, but uh, thanks folks for your patience and uh, thanks for understanding that I can't get to all of them. All right. Quickly, just get rid of that comment, which uh, it's just stuck on the screen. There we go. All right, <laughs> I'm still learning how all this works. All right, weirdest plot twist was Hurricane Zeta in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Why was it uh, the weirdest plot twist? Because the hunter me became the hunted, and it was just uh, it was a crazy ending to the season. So think about it. Uh, you know, you're writing a cheap paperback novel. A hurricane chaser decides to live on the Gulf Coast, and then that year ends up being the busiest Gulf Coast season in a hundred years. And at the very end of the novel, the very last hurricane comes right to the hurricane chaser and smashes the town he lives in. If you wrote a novel like that, the, the publisher would be like, yeah, this is this book is full of crappy cliches. Like we're not going to, this is junk. <laughs> but that's what happened last year. The, fa the finale was the hurricane coming to me and smashing the town and smashing my house. It was crazy stuff. So as I mentioned, Zeta was a double chase. I first got it down in the Yucatan and then I had to hurry back to the U.S. really fast. And I had to really hurry because unlike Delta, the one from two weeks earlier, Zeta was trucking. Zeta just moved across the Gulf really fast and I had to get back quickly. I didn't fly into New Orleans. Instead, I flew into Atlanta because I figured the New Orleans airport, I didn't want to risk it. It might be shut down or something. So I, uh, I flew to Atlanta, got in the sky, flew. Then I did it all night driving across Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi and a typical chaser set up fast food and computer. The two things you can't live without when you're chasing. And I got back to hurricane house that morning, not just for homecoming, but for chasing. And here's Zeta coming across the Gulf 
And here it is as it approached Louisiana. It was strengthening on landfall. Again, just like all the hurricanes last year, not exactly a beautiful specimen, but it was strengthening and it did come ashore as a major. There's Bay St. Louis up there and you could see it approaching. And then finally, boom, we were in the eye wall. And again, it was kind of a mess. Look at this thing. I mean, this is not, this is not what I call a textbook radar presentation, but that right eye wall was, was passing right over Bay St. Louis and, and raked the town pretty good. And here is when we were in the most intense part of it. And at that point, the Yacht Club downtown was re recording sustained winds of 81 miles an hour, gusting well over 100. So Zeta was quite destructive in Bay St. Louis, and this map shows why. So Zeta was accelerating very rapidly to the northeast, and uh, I mean, it was trucking along. And uh, notice how um, Bay St. Louis was on the right side. So since a hurricane is, is spinning in a counterclockwise direction, it means that the forward motion augments or increases the winds on the right side. And Bay St. Louis was on that right side, and we were in that right eye wall. So that right eye wall with the winds augmented by the forward acceleration of the hurricane, just raked the town. And we got raked good. The hurricane left a beautiful day the next day, but a lot of damage. This is across the street from Hurricane House. This is my neighbor's. Their house was totaled. It was just completely destroyed. And then on the main commercial drag, a lot of damage to the facades of buildings, torn gas stations, overturned kiosks, torn roofs, just all over the place. I would call this, by the way, these pictures, this is classic category two damage. It's not catastrophic anywhere, but every building has significant damage. This is downtown Bay St. Louis. The welcome to Bay St. Louis sign just disintegrated into a million pieces. And then they flew and they hit this very popular restaurant, smashing almost every window. Here's the evidence of the storm surge came up over Beach Boulevard up onto the lawns. Here's another shot. This is the Gulf is in the distance there. And look how far inland the, the storm surge came and it left debris everywhere, threw boats onto the street and destroyed piers. Hurricane House got through fine. There were a couple of uh, there were a couple of uh, like torn shingles and stuff like that, but the house was good. The property was a mess. It took me a few days to clean up. I finally finished cleaning up on the 1st of November. And that's the day I got power back, which is very exciting. And then 30 days later, I bid a tearful farewell to Hurricane House. And that brings us to this year, 2021, the plan. What am I doing this year? And let me take a quick question break. Let me just see. Again, the questions are just streaming in, and I'm just trying to read these really fast. If there is a hurricane in California, would I chase it? Absolutely. I would love... I would love the freakiness of that. Actually, there is a, there is a record of one hurricane hitting Southern California. It was uh, recently reanalyzed. It happened in 1858 or 1859. One of you, I'm sure, knows. But it uh, it came and it, it basically it struck San Diego as a Category One with, with estimated winds of around 75 miles an hour. But modern scientists reanalyzed it and based on the, the the data that they had, they assessed it as a hurricane. So it can happen, uh, but it's it's very unusual. And the reason is. The water off Southern California, even LA, is actually freezing. I didn't realize this when I moved here. I thought, oh, palm trees, it's warm. It's not like Florida. You put your foot in the water even in July and it's it's really cold. Yeah, um, as, as Justo Garcia said, totally, absolutely. All right, what other? Lots of, lots of guesses about the last award. Will there be a dedicated question segment at the end? Yes, there will be. There will be. Absolutely. In fact, at first, that's what I was going to do. I was just going to, um, I was going to save all the questions to the end, but then I decided not to do that because I figured folks might want to ask questions as we go. So that's why I wanted to kind of do questions as we go. Uh, thank you, Lois, for the super sticker. I appreciate that very much. The support is very much appreciated. Um, Lindsay, uh, Lindsay asks, what is the most popular footage that I've ever shot? Um, it's a great question. I would say probably Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. I was in a great spot to get unbelievable footage as that Category 4 hurricane just smashed that American territory. Uh, I've had the most, that, that video on my YouTube channel has had the most views and I've probably licensed it the most. It's a great question. Yeah. Michael, thank you for the super chat. Do hurricanes have a smell? That's a great question. I think they do. Um, obviously, it depends. The sounds of a hurricane and the smells of a hurricane depend on the environment that they're hitting. Absolutely. 
Um, I would say a lot of times one smell that comes with hurricanes and people notice this in tornadoes too, is the smell of freshly cut wood because as trees, as branches are torn off, torn off and as trees are, are uprooted, there's wood breaking open and it creates that fresh wood smell. And I would say that's, that's a smell that I associate with hurricanes. It's an, it's actually a pleasant smell, the smell of wood, but it's, it's the smell of destruction. So it's kind of like a, it's a sad smell, but, uh, but I would say that's something that I often associate with hurricanes. Thank you folks for the super chats and super stickers. And I'm really trying to make sure that I, I acknowledge all those because you guys who, who, you know, donate the money, I always want to be thankful. I, it's very nice of you guys. All right. So let's talk about the plan, the plan for 2021. All right. So it's influenced by two things. One is the seasonal forecast for North America. Okay. And as you guys, anyone who's tuning into this is a tropical nerd and already knows that it looks like it's going to be another busy season. Now folks ask me, well, what's my forecast? I'm not a forecaster. Um, I make that really clear. Like I've never pretended to be a forecaster. You know, that's not my game. I'm not the guy on the 11 o'clock news who's telling you what's going to happen. Now, as a hunter, as a chaser, I've got to obviously have some kind of sixth sense for knowing where a hurricane's going to hit or what's going to happen. But uh, I don't always, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a forecaster. And seasonal forecasting, meaning to, uh, predicting what's going to happen uh, in a particular season, that's in its own specialty, but I do know the experts to talk to. And the best one I consider to be Dr. Phil Klotzbach of the Colorado State University. He and his team do what I consider to be the gold standard uh, seasonal forecast. And they're calling for an above average season, as you guys probably all know. Not crazy above average. You could look at the numbers there, just like a little moderately above average. But yeah, they're calling for another busy season for two reasons. One is because the El Nino is very unlikely. For folks who don't know, an El Nino is when you have abnormally warm water in the equatorial Pacific region. What that does is it seems to inhibit hurricane activity in the Atlantic, but it stimulates typhoon activity in the Pacific. So it's like sort of an inverse relationship. And in a La Nina year, which is the opposite, you get a busy Atlantic and a quiet Pacific. This year, it looks like El Nino is very unlikely. It's likely to be what we call an end zone neutral year, meaning neither El Nino or La Nina, or it could be La Nina. So because of that, that's going to help hurricanes, that we're not going to have an El Nino. And the other thing is that the subtropical Atlantic is kind of warm. Now, some folks, some of you in the Gulf Coast have been telling me that the water's freezing uh, when you dip a toe into the, into the Gulf from like Louisiana or Mississippi. I've been hearing that from a lot of you, and you can actually see it. If you look at this map here, you can see that the water is a little chilly right along the Gulf Coast, but that's going to change, actually. That is totally going to uh, uh, warm up really fast. Those are very shallow waters, and they're, they're going to warm up quickly. All right. NOAA also does a forecast, and basically their, their verdict reinforces what Dr. Klotzbach and the CSU team says, that they're expecting an above average season. 60% chance of above average, 30% chance of average. That means that there's only a 10% chance of a slow season. So that factor, the fact that the Atlantic is going to be busy, that's one fact. That's one thing that's uh, that's influencing what I'm going to decide to do this year. And the other thing is the pandemic. Now we're coming out of it. I mean, I, I'll tell you in Southern California, I'm still in LA. I mean, you feel it. The city is just getting back to normal and it's amazing. It feels good for all of us, but world travel is still quite limited, especially in the places where I chase. So here's my 2021 plan. First of all, as you guys probably know, I'm heading back to my beloved hurricane house and I'm going to spend this year in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi again this season. Why? Again, well, if the Atlantic's going to be busy and if I can't hit a lot of my worldwide destinations, if I'm going to be mostly stuck in North America again, it makes sense to be in my second home, in my beloved Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. So I'm going to be back in hurricane house. I'm actually heading back there. I will be back there in exactly a week and I'm very excited about it. Okay, so where am I going to chase? All right, so I've broken it up. I color-coded it because I'm so organized. All right, so there's there's a map of the world, and the yellow is where is where I'm going to be, Bay St. Louis. So the first category of places is places where I'm sure I'm going to be chasing, the yes category. And that's the USA and Mexico and Belize and the Bahamas. Okay. Belize and the Bahamas are still working out some, uh, some of their, uh, uh, travel restrictions, but bottom line is I have, I have a lot of confidence that that's where I'm really going to be chasing this year. And I'm going to be doing most of my work there. So it's going to be a lot like last year. I'm thinking 
Now, unfortunately, there's a couple places I really like to chase that are going to be off limits. And those are, I, I put them in the no category. That's Japan and Taiwan. So those countries got through the pandemic uh, pretty good, actually. They, um, they did a good job of controlling infections. Um, they never had it as bad as we did in the United States. But that's because they like, basically just closed their borders and didn't let anyone in. And they still have very strict entry uh, protocols, for example, long quarantines and other things that you can't do if you're chasing a typhoon. So Japan and Taiwan are pretty much written off for this year. It's very unlikely I'm going to be chasing in those places. Now we get to the middle category, the uncertain category, what I call the maybes. And here's where it gets interesting. These are the places where I am hoping to chase. Now the main one, the prize is the Philippines. Okay, the Philippines is the hurricane capital. Well, they call them typhoons there, but it is the tropical cyclone capital of the world. Okay, so think about it. In the last 170 years, the U.S. has had four Category 5 hurricanes. The Philippines gets a Category 5 typhoon, I calculated, about every four years. Okay, crazy. I mean, they're just constantly getting nailed. So for me as a chaser, this is like the prime chase turf. I am very much hoping that the Philippines is going to be back open for vaccinated people. I'm fully vaccinated. And uh, if they allow vaccinated folks in uh, by the fall, and I'm, some of the stuff I'm reading in the press says they will be, I'll be back in business and able to chase super typhoons in the Philippines again, which I'm very excited about. And then there's some other places I really want to hit. India, I've been dying to chase in. I really, really want to chase in India. And they've been getting a lot of cyclone action the last few years. Their COVID numbers are improving and I'm hoping they might open up. I also want to chase in Oman and Bangladesh. A lot of these places in the, uh, the northern uh, uh, Indian Ocean are very interesting to me. So then as we get late into our year, as we get into um, the, 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 our winter, then the Southern Hemisphere lights back up. Uh, and the Southern Hemisphere, their hurricane season goes from, or their cyclone season goes from the end of our, the year to the beginning of the next. So Southern Hemisphere, uh, the big takeaway is that Australia is going to be off limits, unfortunately. Uh, Australia has had probably the strictest border rules during the COVID uh, pandemic than anyone. And from what I've read, it seems like Australia is going to be closed until well into 2022. So not them, but I'm hopeful about Fiji and New Caledonia. All right. And then we have this final category that I call the complicated category, which are places where I really would like to chase. Uh, probably not this year, but I do want to chase these places. I want to go to Madagascar. I want to chase in Réunion, which is a, actually a territory of France, and the island nation of Mauritius. But those are probably in the future because those places are really hard to get to. They are very out of the way if you're coming from the United States. Okay, so folks have been asking about my other plans, okay? Uh, and I do uh, want to give you some updates. Now, probably the one thing I'm not happy to share in this presentation or in this show is that Hurricane Man Season 2 is not happening, at least not for now. It seems like the suits in London, New York, and Toronto couldn't come to an agreement about it. And unfortunately, I star in the show, but I don't make any decisions about whether it gets made or not. So there will be no Season 2 for now. So that kind of bums me out. But hey, I have some other cool TV projects in the pipeline. I'm working on a pilot series right now with a major streaming network. It's going to be a series about my past chases. And the only reason I'm not naming them is because I haven't signed the contract yet. But if that happens, that'll be really cool. We'll be shooting it this summer. I'll probably have to come, LA to come back to LA for that in between hurricanes, of course. And I'm working on a natural disaster series for a major broadcast network. I'm working on the hurricane episode. I should have a decent uh, on-camera role for that, I'm thinking. And um, I've gotten back to live speaking appearances, which is something that really excites me. This is like, this is, I, I love like the live speaking more than anything because I love interacting with an audience. I like doing it now on a live stream, but in face to face is even better, you know, just that human connection. And I'm also working as a brand ambassador, and I'm excited to tell you about that. And now we get to what might be my favorite portion of the program. Get over it. <laughs> All right. So as you guys know, uh, I'm not shy about sharing my opinions and I will fight to the death to, def to defend them, even when it comes to really super nerdy topics. And in this segment of the show, every episode, I'm going to share a controversial opinion uh, and I'm going to say it very assertively and I'm going to defend it maybe even arrogantly. 
All right, and I'm excited about this week's because or this episode's because this is a this is a topic that I get a lot of heat about. People love to just get on my back about this for so, in social media, and I'm psyched to dig into this. And I'm talking about long range models. All right, without apology. I, yep, I use long range models. I look at the 384 hour GFS. Yes, I do. I'm just saying it. And I like to talk about them. Now I get, I get like I said, I get, I get heat about this on social media. It's usually the young folks who are just starting out with, with hurricane uh, using the computer models. And they, they want to remind me that the long range models have limited accuracy. They're worried that I don't know that, but uh, <laughs> it's four things I want to say about this topic. Number one, we can all agree that long range models are useless when, it's, when we're talking about specifics. So for example, I would never look at a long range computer model and say, oh wow, a category two hurricane is gonna hit uh, Port Isabel, Texas in 12.5 days. Okay, if you're using long range models like that, if you're having discussions about long range models like that, you're not doing it right. I mean, you're definitely, you're, you're deluded. That said, Long range models can provide a very broad understanding of what I call future fer fertility, which means a general understanding of what areas I might need to start looking at. And stuff that I look for in the long range models are one thing is repetition across multiple runs. So if I'm looking at the um, if I'm looking at the GFS and I'm seeing a cluster of closed isobars that's just really sticking in the Northwest Caribbean, you know, in 12 to 14 days, and every run it's there and it just stays there. That's something I start to notice. I'm like, okay, that's kind of interesting. Another thing is when you see agreement among multiple models. So different models might be showing the same feature, the same general feature in the long range. That's interesting to me. I take note of that. And also any trends. If there's a feature in the long range and the models are showing a strong trend with it, for example, it's getting stronger, that is something else that's useful. Now, how is it useful? I'm not going to go buy plane tickets or book hotel rooms. Of course not. But I will start the very early phases of, of just the activities that I need to do to plan a chase. So for example, I might look at the models and say, okay, wow, the, the Bay of Bengal looks like there's going to be, it looks like there's going to be a cyclone or a, low, a strong low pressure system. There's going to be something there week after next. All right. So one thing is I'm going to, I'm going to clear out my schedule for week after next. And I actually, you know what, I'm going to go on the uh, Indian consulate website and I'm going to see if the process for getting an entry visa into India has changed. Little things like that, that you have to start doing well in advance if you want to, you know, do international chasing. And that brings me to my next point is that chaser dudes like me who are hunting around the globe, not just in your backyard, but literally trying to cover the entire globe. We must use long range models. Like seriously, I do not have the luxury not to. Okay. Sure. If I, if I'm just staying in Mississippi and only chasing stuff on the Gulf coast, yeah, I don't need to look at computer models. I'll just look at the radar as it's coming. But if I want to hunt down a eye wall on a remote Japanese Island that requires three connecting flights, literally on the other side of the earth. Yeah. I have to, I have to look at those long range models. It's the only way I could plan and be in place in time. The key to remote penetrations, the key to global coverage as a chaser dude is in the planning. Okay. And that means the models. Point four, I want to say is that Chaser dudes are going to chase her dude. And what I mean is chasers are chasers and they're not forecasters. So since I'm not a forecaster, I'm not the guy who's going to tell you, you know, the weather that you're going to get. I'm using the models for a different reason. I'm not using it to build a forecast. I'm using it because I'm a hunter and these are, these are my first tools on a hunt. These are the first things that I start to use to sniff the prey. Okay. And I got to sniff that way in advance of actually going out on the hunt. And another thing is that chasers are going to talk about what's on their mind on Twitter and elsewhere. You know, it's funny, uh, James Reynolds, uh, James, the British dude who lives in Tokyo, uh, he's, he's uh, another major tropical cyclone chaser. He's, I call him the king of the Western Pacific because he's, that, is his, that is his domain and he's the most experienced in that basin. James and I, we chat privately every day on Twitter and, and we will often like talk about, it's like just like one of our, our, our common topics like every day is we're both looking at the long range models. Half the time we're joking about what we're seeing because you see some crazy stuff, especially in the GFS. But yeah, we're always talking about them. We're always watching them and I will tweet about them. So bottom line, to conclude this spicy segment, 
I will continue to use long range models and I'll continue to talk about them. They're my daily bread. And if you don't like it, all I could say is get over it. All right. And with that, I want to get to some more wholesome family friendly fun. But first I will check and see, maybe I'll take a couple more comments or questions because I, I've been seeing a lot coming by here. Um, let me see. Custo Garcia asks, have I ever thought about chasing tornadoes? Great question. Um, one of the, there are many weird things about me, but one of the weirdest is that I'm extremely and narrowly specialized, meaning I don't chase other types of weather. I just wanted to be like the top guy at hurricanes and, and not just because I'm competitive, but because hurricanes are what I grew up with and what I have passion about. So, uh, I stick to hurricanes. Now, would I like to see a tornado? Sure. Do I sometimes, sometimes watch tornado videos on YouTube? Oh yeah, sure. You know, especially if it's like close up, I love that stuff. And I would like to see a tornado one day. Um, but I would not, uh, it's never going to be a priority for me. Uh, watch weather. Thank you very much for the super chat. I very much appreciate it. That is very kind of you. All right, let's see what else. What other, there's just like so many questions. I can't even like, Okay, Sam asks, uh, what, what chase is the single most personally gratifying in my career? Um, I would say, again, I hate to keep bringing it up, but probably Hurricane Dorian. You know, it was, it was, it was the chaser's like holy grail, okay? There was just, there was like, it, it, it was just a, a, an experience that I, I, I'm sure it was like the peak of my career. It was the strongest hurricane on record in North America. It had a perfect eye wall. I went right through the eye. It was on a, you know, a, a small, basically flat island. So there was no friction. It was just like a, a, a perfect sampling of an incredibly powerful hurricane. And it was in the middle of the day. So I could see what was happening. So and the pressure, I'm sorry, the data I collected was amazing. I mean, I measured 913 millibars in the eye. I mean, I never thought I was going to measure a pressure like that, like just be in person. So I would say, Dorian, in terms of uh, the, the the hurricane that got away, um, yeah, no, I, I, I have a very specific answer, and that would be Hurricane Charlie uh, in Punta Gorda and Port Charlotte in uh, Florida in 2004. Uh, I was living in Europe at the time. I had about a decade where I was living in Eastern Europe. I was just uh, some business reasons. I won't go into it, but I was living in Prague and I had a few years where I was not a chaser dude. I was just this, like dude living in Europe. And uh, it was unfortunately during the 2004 season and Charlie, it was like my kind of hurricane, that really intense, tight little eye wall. Oh my God. And just like, and every chaser who chased that, I mean, all the dudes who got inside that thing got amazing footage. It looks really dramatic. It was just, you know, I'm really into structure and Charlie had a beautiful structure. And that was the one to this day, I really regret it. Thank you for that question and bring up these painful memories. Now I'm going to block you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I'm just looking at the questions here. Uh, to Vold asked, what was Irma like for me? Uh, Irma was, um, a, a good hurricane. I was in Naples, so I got it as a category three. It was a category four in the, in the, uh, Florida Keys. It was a three in Naples. Uh, there's a video of it on my, uh, on my YouTube channel and you can check the front eye wall. It was another half a cane. It was actually kind of like Sally where the front side was really intense, but there was nothing on the backside, but it was, um, it was a good, it was a, like an intense hurricane. And, uh, and I, um, I was impressed by it, but I wouldn't say it was one. It was, it was not like in my top 10. Alicina, I was Ali asked, would I ever chase a hurricane if it's heading to New England? So I might. Okay. So I grew up on Long Island, which is not New England, but most hurricanes that hit New England have to hit Long Island first because Long Island is sort of the, the first barrier. So if there was sort of a, what looked like a repeat of the 1938 hurricane coming, a really intense storm just blasting up the coast at breakneck speed. I might go after that just because it would be historically interesting. And in fact, as someone who grew up on Long Island, I, if I could experience five historic hurricanes, you know, I could go back in the time machine. One of them would definitely be the 1938 hurricane because as a Long Islander, um, that was the one that I heard about all the time. That was, that was, the, that's the, that was, you know, in Mississippi, they talk about Camille, you know, now Katrina, you know, on Long Island, they talk about the 1938 hurricane, which just flattened islands on the South shore. It was a strong category three when it hit, which up, up North like that, that's really unusual. So, um, so yeah, so I would say like, I, there's a chance I could do it. Um, Tank Eyes 117 and Goat Eyes 117 asked, do you watch Pecos Hank? Yes, actually I do. I am a big, big admirer 
of Pecos Hank's work. Uh, we, he and I have never met. We like follow each other on social media, but we've never actually traded messages or anything. But I really, I, I think he's, first of all, he's a very good chaser. And secondly, he's a magician with cameras. I mean, some of his stuff is just gorgeous. Uh, he had a recent video of, he was really close up of, I think it was a tornado in Oklahoma and you could see it passing over some, uh, like a, some kind of like a, a, a shed or a grain storage building, but it's just like, oh my God, he has different cameras getting it from different angles. He is a true, I, Hank, Pecos Hank is kind of like an artist. I really think of him as an artist. I mean, he's, I, I really admire his work. He's someone who for me really stands out. I really, I really dig his work a lot. So uh, thank you for asking about him. I like to, I like to talk about some of the other chasers who I enjoy. Tavold, great question. Is there any storm that you think was a different intensity to the official? Yeah, there are a couple. I mean, in general, I think that the National Hurricane Center and the official agencies do a very good job. Um, and I mostly agree with them, but there are a couple that I don't. One was Hurricane Odile in Cabo San Lucas. You could see my video on this channel, but man, uh, Hurricane Odile was really crazy and the wind damage was unbelievable. And they kept it as a category three. And I, I really feel it, the wind damage I saw after it was worse than most category fours I've been in. And I think that they should have upgraded it in post analysis, but they kept it at 110 knots, 115 and higher is category four. And I disagree with that. And there's another one that I really disagree with the Joint Typhoon Warning Center about, which I'm actually going to talk about in a minute in another segment. All right. Now I want to get back to um, when I get back to the presentation. I want to talk, talk about Dell Tech Homes. So I'm a brand ambassador for Dell Tech Homes, full disclosure, but that doesn't matter. This is something that I'm very excited about. So what's a Dell Tech Home? What are they? Put simply, they're hurricane resistant houses, okay? But to describe it in a little more detail, they're houses that can withstand extremely high winds. And I mean extremely high winds, okay? But also, and just as important, they're houses that connect you to nature while protecting you. And that's something really important. That's an important point to make. Now, up until I learned about Dell Tech and became a brand ambassador for them, I had this idea that a, a hurricane, a, a truly hurricane resistant house had to be like, you know, five foot thick concrete walls, you know, steel doors, tiny, like, you know, porthole windows. That was my idea of a hurricane uh, resistant house. Okay. And Dell Tech Homes really kind of disabused me of that and gave me another, a whole other understanding. These are Dell Tech Homes and look at them. I mean, they're super bright and airy here. I'll make the picture bigger so you can see it better, but they're open and airy and check out all those huge ass windows. I mean, these are really like, these are homes that if you live in them, they allow you to really enjoy the natural surroundings and to really just appreciate them. Okay. Now, when they came to me, when they approached me about being a brand ambassador, at first I was kind of skeptical. I was like, hmm, but then I did my research. And once I did my research, I was convinced. And what convinced me was the ultimate test. And that's my name for my discovery. I call it the ultimate test. That wasn't some marketing slogan they gave me. So Dell Tech, they gave me uh, a spreadsheet of all of their houses all over the US Gulf Coast and East Coast and all over the Caribbean. They got houses everywhere. And they gave me the locations of all of them and I plotted them all and I looked at which ones had had direct hits by category four and category five hurricanes. And lo and behold, I found two that had a direct hit by Hurricane Dorian, okay? So keep in mind, I mentioned before, Hurricane Dorian, the strongest landfalling hurricane on record in North America with sustained winds of 185 miles an hour, tied with the 1935 Labor Day hurricane. These two houses, and the stars show where they are uh, on the map, these two houses went through not just the core of Hurricane Dorian, but the dreaded right front quadrant, which is the strongest part of the storm. So these Dell Tech homes, just that to me is the ultimate test. And they got through with very little damage. Okay, just some cosmetic stuff. Here's one of them. Okay, it's a, the photograph quality is not amazing, but there you can see everything the shrubs, the trees, everything's just flattened and blown away. And there's that house with just really uh, the only damage to it is it lost some roofing material. That's after the strongest hurricane on record in North America. That's a sturdy house. 
And here's another good example. This is uh, actually not from Dorian. This is from a hurricane that was not nearly as strong as Dorian, but that was still a Cat 5. This is from Michael in Mexico Beach. And look at it. Everything is flattened and gone except the Dell Tech home. Again, just a little bit of damage to the roofing materials. So that's kind of amazing. So once I saw that, I was like, okay, that's crazy. How did that happen? How did they stay up? Now, I'm not an engineer, but I did want to understand it so I could talk about it, peek under the hood. And uh, basically, it comes down to three things. There are three reasons that these houses are so wind resistant. First off is you probably noticed the round shape. It's a distinguishing feature. And it's not just a, a, an aesthetic thing. They're round because they are aerodynamic. Okay. I didn't know this because I'm not an engineer, but, you know, a normal house, you know, the... Um, the walls, you know, reach each other at a right angle and the wind pressure is greatest at those right angles. When you have a round home, there are no right angles. The winds distribute more evenly around the structure. It's more aerodynamic. So the pressure doesn't get to build up in any one place. So that's one thing that makes them extremely wind resistant, that they're aerodynamic. The next thing is the materials. So I didn't know this, but there's like, not all wood is created equal. Some wood is crap and some is really, really strong. The wood that they use for Deltec is this, it's this diamond grade wood, which is literally twice the hardness of the wood that's typically used to build homes in the United States. And that really makes a difference. Now I had this big misconception that the only hurricane resistant homes are made of concrete with steel rods in them. It's actually not true. Wood homes can withstand extremely high winds if it's the right kind of wood and if it's if it's built properly. And that brings us to the third uh, point, which is the precision engineering. So think about a high performance car, okay? You got like, you know, like a Porsche or something. Think about it. They, they create the parts and the elements and they put it all together in a very controlled environment. So like it's, it's a factory that's almost like a laboratory. Okay. That's how Dell Tech homes are. So think about normal homes. They just build the whole thing like on a lot. And with Dell Tech, they build most of the home and the components in a very controlled environment in their uh, plant in North Carolina. And then those parts are then brought to the lot and then assembled, okay? So there's real precision in terms of the parts and everything else. And then the way they're put together is amazing. Everything is so fit together. You think of the house not as a bunch of loose parts, but as this like really, really intensely integrated system. So in a badly built house, the roof is just kind of nailed on. On a better built house, you'll have a couple of straps kind of holding it. Okay, with a Dell Tech home, the roof is held on by these big ass saddle ties that tie around the sort of the, 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 the main structural elements along the top of the wall. And the walls are connected to the foundation with these deep sort of connectors that go that go actually underground. So this house is a very, very solidly integrated system of, of parts that share the load and that hold together in extremely high winds. And those three reasons are why those, those houses in the Bahamas withstood a high-end Category 5 hurricane with just minor damage. It's really incredible stuff. And the other thing I want to say is that they're gorgeous houses. They're not bunkers. They're not ugly concrete blocks. They're open and airy and just beautiful. And they're good for the planet. Uh, they're made with sustainable materials. And also think about it. There's nothing more sustainable than houses that don't fall apart. Because one thing that is you know, bad for our planet is houses constantly being destroyed and being rebuilt. If you want to know more about Dell Tech Homes, you can go to DellTechHomes.com and actually check it out on the homepage. They just put up a new video and it's really gorgeous. It really gives you the feeling of what it's like to live in a Dell Tech home. And they're really, really beautiful. And I want to thank Dell Tech for being a partner in creating this live stream. All right, that's Dell Tech. And now I want to bring you on a blast from the past. And this is another, this will be another regular segment. Forgot all right so even from the questions on this live stream you guys can tell that everyone wants to hear about super typhoon Haiyan, hurricane dorian people want to hear about the greats like the, the the historic storms and when i go to conferences to speak or when i'm on tv shows talking about my chases it, people always want to hear about those it's like they're the greatest hits but I've been on a lot of other really cool and interesting chases that no one asks about. And in this section of the of this show, every every uh, episode, I will highlight a, her, a typhoon or a, a hurricane that no one asks me about anymore, but that was really cool and interesting. And this week's 
selection allows me to spotlight an area that I love chasing and I haven't been able to chase it recently, which is Taiwan. So if you don't know, Taiwan, um, it, it, technically it's part of China, but it, it uh, well, it's, it's a controversy I don't want to get into. It's technically part of China, but it, it functions as a separate country. So while, you know, as an American, you can't, you can't just, uh, you can't just like wander into China. Like you would have to get a visa beforehand and stuff like that. Uh, Taiwan is like, it's like going to Europe. You could just show up and come in. It's a, it's a open democratic society. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons why I like chasing in Taiwan. First of all, it gets very intense typhoons. This is uh, this map shows all the category and three higher typhoons that have hit Taiwan since 1980. And you can see they get a lot of action. And the other thing I like about Taiwan as chase turf is the orientation of the coastline. Check out that, that north, northeast, south, southwest orientation. And the way the typhoons come in, they hit at a right angle. They hit the coast at a right angle. It's nice and clean. They're coming in perpendicular. And as a chaser, you like that because that's easier to get a clean penetration. When a hurricane is moving along the coast, then it becomes messy and complicated. And there are other reasons that I like chasing there. Uh, one is the solid infrastructure. Taiwan is a very modern, uh, it's a total first world country with excellent roads, excellent buildings, excellent power grid. Uh, it really, it's, this is a solidly built country and that makes chasing there easier. And then the other thing is that there's just basically no crime. I mean, I'm sure there's some crime, but you just never hear about violent crime there. You, uh, you never hear about any crime. So it's this very orderly society. And when you're alone from the, and you're, you're chasing there and you're not from there, uh, just, you know, just the great infrastructure and the low crime, it just, you feel very like, you know, you feel safe, you feel good. So it's a place where I really like chasing. That said, there are a couple of things that make it very hard to chase there. The first thing is the terrain. Okay. So in the Atlantic, we talk about Hispaniola with those high mountain peaks. We, we, we talk about how any hurricane that hits Hispaniola, just, it's like going into a blender. It just gets totally torn up. Okay. Taiwan is the Western Pacific's Hispaniola. I mean, if you look at that satellite picture, you can check out those mountain peaks. That, that <laughs> Those are some high mountain peaks and typhoons that come near it. Uh, they, they, um, they, they really have problems once they get over that terrain. But the thing about it is that it makes chasing very hard. So if you look at this, okay, the East Coast is what gets the typhoons. Okay, there's, high, there's a highway going up and down the East Coast. And you think, okay, wow, that's great. That must be easy to chase. It must be like chasing going up the I-95 in Florida or like the Highway 77 in Texas. No, it's not like that because it is not flat. This is a scary, twisty, like crazy mountain road. Um, that's alongside huge cliffs and everything else. And as you're driving, as a typhoon approaches and it starts to rain a lot, you'll get spectacular landslides and stuff like this. When I say landslides, I mean scary stuff. Like check out like boulders, like whole hills just collapsing onto the highway. Check out that boulder. If that thing fell on your car, you would just be killed instantly. So when I'm chasing in Taiwan and I'm going up and down that highway, there's always this feeling of like... Uh, like, like sudden death is possible at any time. And that's a scary thing to deal with. And also those mountains do weird things to the hurricane or to the typhoon. As the typhoon approaches Taiwan, um, it's almost like it's, it's approaching kryptonite. It starts to smell those mountains. I think the mountains, maybe the, uh, they interfere with the inflow of the typhoon, but the typhoon will start to get almost confused as it approaches the island. The eye might start to fill in and then the, and then the typhoon might make a weird right or left hook or do some weird surprise that throws off your entire chase at the last second. And I'm convinced it's because of those mountains. So there's that. And then the other big challenge is the language barrier. So there's very little English spoken there. It's not like if you go to Germany or you go to the Netherlands and like everyone speaks English. It's like so easy. <laughs> it is not like that in Taiwan. Very little English spoken. So that means when you're on your own, it's it's slow going. You know, everything from renting a car to getting a hotel room to just ordering food. It's just everything to just getting gas. Everything becomes really difficult because this is what you're looking at the whole time. Now, it's my fault, obviously. I should learn Chinese, but I'm not going to. So that is a challenge I deal with. Now, I have a Canadian friend who lives there and he's lived there for years. His wife is Taiwanese. So he's now fluent in Chinese. And he sometimes I've hired him as like a fixer driver to come with me. And that is like, my God, that makes it so easy. But most of the time that I've chased in Taiwan, I was alone and this made it tough. All right. So now that I've set up this awesome and interesting environment for you, I want to talk about one of my favorite chases of all time that is totally forgotten. 
And that is Super Typhoon Nepertoc of 2016. So check it out. This is as it was approaching Taiwan. And man, that's a, that's a mean looking typhoon. And it was. It was estimated at its peak to have 155 knot winds, which is like 180 miles an hour, well into category five. And here's the track. This is a chaser's dream. This is the kinds of, 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 of storms we like to chase. Long, straight, predictable track over many days. This is the kind of storm where, you know, I knew days before that I was going to chase it because everything about it, the modeling, everything was just very clear. The steering current was well established and there were no surprises. Just it went days and days uh, until landfall. Now, the, uh, the hurricane made landfall in southern Taiwan on July 7th, and the official intensity, and before I was asked, someone asked a question, do I ever disagree with official intensity estimates? This is one where I very strongly disagree. The official intensity estimate at landfall was 110 knots. Now, <laughs> there's no way it was 110 knots. It was like, this thing was definitely a category four. It was wild. Uh, I've chased a lot of typhoons and hurricanes. And also my good friend, James Reynolds, who is as experienced as I with typhoons, he and I both chased the storm. We were both in the core and he and I both agree that this thing absolutely was not just a category four, but a strong category four. This thing was a scary, ferocious uh, storm. And, you know, James, like, James's specialty is typhoons and he's been in more typhoons than anyone. And yeah, we both agreed on this, that this like Nepper talk was absolutely just, uh, it, this thing was a super here it is as it approached. And you can see, man, it looked like that's like a buzzsaw coming towards Southern Taiwan. I chased it in Taidong city, which is a big port city in Southern uh, Taiwan. And that put me in the North eye wall and gave me just, I was put just in the right spot for an extreme impact. Here's the, the radar track, meaning I looked at all the radar pictures and I plotted the path of the center. And you could see it wiggled a bit as it approached Taiwan. And then it did some very weird turns over that terrain that we talked about. But you could see I was just north of the center in Taidong City. And when I showed you this radar shot, you could see why the, the typhoon was so strong there because I was in that dreaded right front quadrant of this very strong typhoon. And here's what it was like on the ground. So just to give you a little context, I wrote out this uh, typhoon in a hotel tower, a high rise tower uh, in the middle of a city. So it was in an urban area. So you'll see some of the shots in the beginning are from the front entrance. Then they had to bolt the entrance. So I had to stay inside the lobby. Uh, one thing that you can't see that was happening was that the tower was swaying so violently in the wind that guests to the hotel were like freaked out and were coming down to the lobby because they thought the building was going to tip over. And I talked to one old Taiwanese dude who actually did speak English and he said he'd been in many typhoons. And he said, oh my God, that was the worst one I've ever seen. And then finally, the restaurant next to the um, lobby all the windows break and, and the place just gets totally trashed. That's what you'll see in this video, just to kind of give you a little context there. But yeah, let's take a look at this mean, mean typhoon, super typhoon Nepper talk. destroyed broken windows everywhere flying glass the restaurant just broken open holy crap
people definitely a little concerned. Whoa. Now I'm wondering about these doors, if these are going to go next. We're not safe any direction. All right, so that was the brute force of Super Typhoon Nemper talk. And here's the data. Uh, since I didn't go through the eye, typically if you're not in the eye of a typhoon or a hurricane, you get the lowest pressure during the strongest winds, which is what it ha what happened. It was a little below 958 millibars. And uh, if you check out the damage, okay, like I said before, you know, in Taiwan and Japan, you know, things are really solidly built. So you'll come outside after Category 4 Typhoon in one of these uh, countries, and, and you'll see very little damage because stuff is so solid there. But after Nepertak, there was a lot of damage. I mean, there were collapsed buildings all over Taidong City. I mean, this this thing was definitely a distinctive typhoon. And uh, cars were just thrown around like toys. Now, they're, they're, excuse me, their cars tend to be a little smaller than ours, but still impressive. And in this picture, it actually got me most of all. Check this out. These palm trees, these are thick healthy palm trees and look at not one not two all of them got just snapped off mid trunk by those winds and it doesn't there's no other buildings around so there wasn't any kind of weird funneling effect those those are just that was the brute force of super typhoon nepertalk that was like that thing was the real deal and uh even though it's forgotten it well it's not forgotten by me i uh nepertalk will always be one of the greatest typhoons that i've been in all right uh, that's it with the prepared uh, discussion. So I guess, uh, you know, I could open up to more questions and comments and I could just do that, you know, uh, just totally focused on it. So yeah, ask away. I'm actually going to look through, I see there's a lot of questions here and I'm trying to just uh, get caught up here. Wow. A lot of really cool, a lot of really cool comments and questions. Uh how is the power still on? It was still on because the building was on a generator or because the power grid, I think, I think that building was on a generator, but also in, in a lot of Taiwan and Japan, the power grid's just really solid and it'll stay up in very strong hurricanes. Now in my hurricane Odile video, which is uh, the one at a, you know, it's probably my most famous video. It's in a, it's in a holiday Inn lobby that gets totally destroyed by the wind. It's on my channel, hurricane Odile. Uh, the power stayed on in that one because the building was on a generator. So yeah. Uh, Michael Hill asked, what was the most challenging chase of my career? God, great question, man. Um, that's a really great question. I would again, bring it back to super typhoon Haiyan and hurricane Dorian, uh, Haiyan in the Philippines, Dorian in the Bahamas, because both of those caused catastrophic damage. And with both of those, I was, uh, I was stuck in those places for days and needing to survive afterwards. So it wasn't just the storm. It was just, it was just, you know, getting through the aftermath and figuring out a way to get home. So I would say those are very challenging, but I've had so many others, you know, especially the ones in East Asia. Cause you know, think about it before I could even start chasing, there's a 14 or 16 hour flight after that, after that giant flight. And I'm just kind of, you know, a little sort of jet lagged and everything else. Then I got to just, you know, drive 16 hours, you know, there's stuff like that. So the, the chases, especially in the Philippines tend to be, they're all huge plane rides, huge road trips and everything else. Uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. Tropical Cyclone 295 asked, if a hurricane hit Europe, would I chase it? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, I wouldn't expect that to happen. Now, I know occasionally you'll get a really intense hurricane in the eastern Atlantic and it recurves toward Europe and everyone starts to freak out like, oh my God, Europe's going to get a hurricane, but it never happens. And I know that, uh, which one was it? I'm sure one of you guys knows, but there was one that was heading for Ireland two years ago and it like, it actually was, it kept its hurricane status till like within, within 24 hours of hitting Ireland, which was, it got like weirdly close. But listen, if I could be in the right place at the right time, I guess maybe I would, because it would be cool to be in such a, uh, you know, in such a kind of like, in such an, a, a meteorologically freaky event. I mean, that would make it kind of cool. Um, Husto, um, I did not experience super typhoon Maranti. I did not. Um, actually, Maranti, at its peak intensity, it passed over um, that island called Itbayat uh, in the northern Philippines. And uh, the people on that island got it at full force. And it was actually apparently as strong as Haiyan. 
All right. Just uh, see what else here. Just looking for. Um, Sam James asks, what do you think people's obsession with weather is? It's a great question. I think, I think it's like a, I think it's like people who like cilantro versus people who don't. I think there are per certain people who are born just with, they're just, they're born weather nerds. They're just, they're just like, they get excited by violent weather. They just like to watch it. And, uh, and it is what it is. And then there are other people that aren't like my two sisters, I have two older sisters. They don't get this at all. Like I could show them, you know, category five winds blowing a house apart. They just like, it, it would be like if they showed me a, a, a video about knitting, they just, they don't get it. They don't care. It's like, it's not exciting to them. Whereas other people are like, wow, that's incredible. So I think just some of us just are, you know, our brains are just wired that way. I know for me, as far back as I can remember, when I was a toddler, you know, I'd, I'd get very excited by like when there was thunder or when there was enough wind that the house would start shaking. I would just get really excited by that. It was like drugs. And I think that that was just something I was born with. That said, I have noticed that environment has something to do with it too. Like I noticed one of the things I love about living in Mississippi is that everyone, I mean, everyone, I mean, the person who cuts your hair, the, per the cashier at the grocery store, like the, the, the waiter in the restaurant, everyone in Mississippi is a hurricane nerd. I mean, every one of them is very knowledgeable and has a couple of amazing stories to share. And that's because of course, this is their, this is their world, you know, and it's, uh, and it's interesting to them because these are some of the big experiences, you know, for, for someone who lives in coastal Mississippi, you know, Camille in 1969 and Katrina in 2005, these are life changing experiences. Uh, for them. Cameron asked, why didn't I chase Matthew? Actually, I did chase Matthew. I chased Matthew uh, in the Bahamas. I was on New Providence Island, or, which is where the Nassau is. Matthew was my, I have very negative memories of it because it was my very last bust. I was, I was well inside the zone of hurricane force winds, but the absolute, the eyewall missed my location by a couple of miles. And I it's a long story, but I, I didn't relocate in time. And so it was, it technically counts as a bust. I don't, I don't include it in my portfolio because I missed the eyewall by a couple of miles. So uh, I saw a very strong winds. I mean, the palm trees in front of my hotel got all snapped up and everything, but uh, I did chase it. And I, I, I kind of, yeah, I have negative memories of it because it was not a successful chase. Pam in South Carolina. Great question. What hurricanes in the past, far past, do I wish I could have chased? It's funny you ask because I actually did a, um, I actually made a list once of like, what would be the ones that I wish I chased? So of historic hurricanes, I would say, I'll throw some out there. The great ninth, the Long Island Express hurricane of 1938. That's the one that hit New York and New England. It was the strongest known landfall in that region, or at least since the 1600s. Um, that's one I, I would just want to see that. And actually what I really like is to see a radar shot of that hurricane. What did it look like? Because I, I'm pretty sure it didn't look like, like a fully tropical hurricane. I think it was transitioning. I mean, did it look weird? Was it a half a cane? What it, did it look like an extra tropical, like comma? I would, I would, I would pay serious money to have a radar shot of the Long Island Express 1938 hurricane at landfall. So I would have chased that. Uh, definitely Camille because Camille is like, I grew up, reading about Camille and fantasizing about it. And just, um, it's fun living in Bay St. Louis, which is ground zero for Camille. Um, I definitely would have wanted to have been in um, Hurricane King in Miami in October, 1950. This is a weird hurricane. It was a category four, but it was really, really, really tiny. It had a radius of maximum winds of about three or four miles. So it was basically like a big tornado, but it made a perfect direct bullseye hit on downtown Miami. And the worst part about it is they weren't expecting it. They thought a hurricane was coming, but like not, no big deal, but it, it rapidly intensified just before it came ashore. So imagine this, a category four hurricane ramming into downtown Miami with no one expecting it. Uh, just the way that hurricane was so small and violent, I would have liked to have witnessed that firsthand. And then one other one would be a Hurricane Janet, a category five that hit Chetumal, Mexico. I would like to have been in that one. That was uh, another storm that I've always fantasized about. Great question. There are so many though. I mean, there's probably 20 that I could come up with that I wish that I'd been in. Okay, what's the strongest Florida hurricane that not on the panhandle that I've chased? Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, you know, my record in Florida, I've not had, like, my top chases in my career have not been in Florida. Even though it's the most hurricane-prone state in the union, I've had I've not had my best chases there. Um, 
I mean, I've had good chases, successful ones, but not ones where I'm like, oh, this is like in my top list. Of course, Michael's a big exception. Michael, you know, the category five that hit the panhandle, that was obviously a very big deal. Um, I was very impressed by Wilma, uh, the category three that hit the Southwest coast and then blasted the East coast. That was one, uh, I had, I had not chased for a few years. I'd sort of taken, I was living in Europe as I told you guys and that, uh, and hurricane Wilma was when I had just come back from Europe and I was like really hungry to chase again. And Wilma was the first hurricane I'd been in, in years. And I just, wow. Uh, maybe that's why it just seems so intense to me, but I was really like, I was, I was really into Wilma. And I remember thinking it felt really strong while I was hitting the back eye wall, not the, not the front eye wall, but the back eye wall. Um, I, I think, uh, I think Hurricane King was like Ernesto, but much, much stronger. Uh, I agree the 1926 great Miami hurricane and the 1928 uh, Lake Okeechobee hurricane would have been fascinating ones to have been in. Now, regarding Katrina, yes, Katrina was a, hur a category three at landfall in Louisiana and Mississippi. But remember the 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 scale uh, is based on winds. So, from a wind perspective, Katrina was a category three. But in terms of storm surge, Katrina produced the highest storm surge in American history on the Mississippi coast, actually right at Base St. Louis and around St. Louis Bay and past Christiane, almost thirty feet. And some of the locals tell me they swear it was higher than thirty feet. So Katrina, although it was only category three from a storm surge perspective, absolutely it is, in my opinion, just the top hurricane. And not only was the storm surge high, you know, it it covered so much of the coast. My God, I mean, there was just a huge, huge, uh, basically the entire Mississippi coast to Pascagoula was just devastated. I mean, it's really it's uh, uh, the Katrina storm surge is amazing, and every every miss every coastal Mississippian that you talk to will tell you about it just that they uh they just it, it was a life-changing experience for them and uh yeah golden twister wants to know what was the most nerve-wracking storm that i chased in 2020 god good question um i would say probably laura because um it was you know like i said category four at night uh you know in a in a swampy area that's very low lying i just felt like there were a lot of things that made it dangerous Plus, I knew it was going to be, you know, it was obviously going to be a big historic hurricane. And there's that there's that pressure of with these with these big historic hurricanes, I feel the pressure like, my God, I can't mess this up. I've got to I've got to chase this successfully. I've got to get in the eye or at least the eye wall. The fear of, of busting is a strong motivator for me, especially with the historic storms. If I chase in a, like one of these really great historic storms, like a Laura, for example, or a Michael and miss the core, oh my God, just having to walk around with that feeling for the rest of my career, oh, I mean, that would just that would be painful. That would be absolutely painful. And I think I was feeling some of that pressure while I was chasing Laura. I knew it was an important hurricane and I had to, I had to come through and uh, yeah. So it, it created a lot of stress for me. And also just yeah, worrying that I was going to die in the storm surge, which ended up not being so bad where I was just because of the track that it took. Lenore Nor asks, how do I afford this? So uh, hurricane chasing used to be a very expensive hobby for me. It was just something I was so passionate about that I just I was willing to spend the money. Uh, now it's uh, now it's something I, I make money with. Now I want to be really clear: I don't chase to make money, but it is something where I'm. It's it's a it's one of two careers that I have, and uh, yeah. So between my TV work and my uh, brand ambassador work and licensing footage and speaking appearances, you know, it, uh, it it turns out to be a decent living. Now it's hard to do that, and I want to actually. I'm glad you mentioned this because I know a lot of young folks. Are, you know, a lot of people want to. They want to, you know, especially a lot of young weather nerds, you know, want to fantasize about chasing for a living. You can, it's, but it's hard to do. I mean, it's, uh, you know, very few guys have been able to manage it and uh, it requires some creativity and some real media savvy and you got to find your niche in the scene. For me, it was uh, TV, you know, uh, different guys make their money different ways. Those of us who really make a, a living from it. For me, it was, you know, working as a, a TV personality and then from that getting speaking engagements, live speaking engagements, which, you know, which pay pretty well. So, yeah. And then the, the video licensing actually really adds up, especially when you have a big score. You know, you could have a bunch of duds, but if you get in like, you know, a major storm, 
you know, uh, you can really, uh, you know, you can, and you get some decent, uh, you get some decent footage, you know, you can really make some good money on that. Cameron asks, have I ever experienced a strong earthquake? Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a Southern Californian. I live in LA. So the strongest that I've experienced was the, uh, the great Northridge earthquake of 1994. I was very young. I was just out of college. I just moved here from New York, so I'd never been in an earthquake. This was a 6.7 magnitude that was actually centered in the city. <laughs> like it was, it was centered right under the city. So uh, LA shook very violently. So there's this, um, there's the, the, there's the magnitude scale, but then there's another scale called the modified Mercalli scale. And that goes from uh, one to 12. And that measures the violence of the shaking on the ground. And uh, that, that hurt, that, earthquake, I think uh, it, the level nine, it, the, the level of shaking in LA was up to level nine, which is, which is very violent. And it was, it was a scary earthquake happened in the middle of the night. I was in bed like everyone in LA. I was, uh, all I remember is just holding onto my bed, everything falling on top of me and the bed was moving across the room. And that was, it was wild. It was really, uh, it was, I'll tell you in some ways it was scarier than any hurricane I'd been in because it was just, you know, just unexpected. You know, that's the thing about earthquakes. They could happen when you're sleeping. They could happen when you're like sitting on the toilet. I mean, they could, there's no warning in there. And when it happens, it's, uh, you know, you really have to, uh, you have to really be, be aware. Tavold asks, what was the weakest storm I've ever chased? Uh, probably one that was even more embarrassing than my uh, ECES chase this year. It was, it was tropical storm Don in like 2011, I think. But um, I was visiting a friend in the uh, I was visiting a friend in the in uh, Texas, and there was a tropical storm named Don uh, in the Gulf, and it was coming toward the coast. And we thought maybe it'll be a hurricane. We went to Baffin Bay. It totally fell apart. It passed over us as a depression. My barometer measured a two millibar drop in the pressure. It was uh, it was uh, pretty embarrassing. Yeah. Question here from Dirt Monster. Would I chase a 200 plus mile storm if given the chance? Well, actually I did. So when Eric, my friend Eric and I were chasing uh, Hurricane Patricia in the Pacific, it was a 200 mile an hour hurricane. Now it ended up weakening a little. It came ashore at 150 miles an hour. But while we were chasing it, it was, a, it was actually, at the time it was rated 200. In post analysis, they rated it 215. But the thing is, we were chasing a 200 mile an hour storm and, and we were, we were trying to penetrate the eye. So we, uh, so we were, we were doing it. So yes. Yeah, so if, if given the chance I do, and, uh, who's still in tank guys are saying 215. Yes. Patricia was 215, but that was what they assigned it in post analysis operationally in real time. Um, they, they were describing it as a 200 mile an hour hurricane. So probably if we knew it was 215, we would have been even more nervous about it. But at the time we thought we were chasing a 200 mile an hour hurricane. What motivates me to chase hurricanes? Well, um, I, I think early on it was just, you know, I was in college and a hurricane was going up the East coast and I I'd been in hurricanes, but ones that had come to my hometown on long Island. And then 1991, I was, uh, I was living in Washington DC for the summer and hurricane Bob was coming up the coast and I just really wanted to be in, be in it. So I, I got on a train. I was too young to rent a car. I had some cash. This was before mobile phones or anything like that. And I took a train up to New York and I took another train to Providence. That was my first chase on a train <laughs> with a little duffel bag with a change of clothes and $200. Uh, the point is I chased because I just wanted to be in it. And by the way, back then, uh, I didn't even have a camera. It didn't occur to me to even shoot video. I just wanted to be in it and experience it. And of course, in 1991, there's no social media. So there's no audience, no one following what you're doing. You did it just because you wanted the experience of being in it. And uh, I look back to those days, you know, sometimes I miss it. You know, now it's fun having an audience when you chase, you know, people following what you're doing. As I said to you guys in the beginning, I love, you know, you guys give me so much strength. But, you know, a side of me kind of misses just, you know, being just random dude chasing, no social media, no camera, nothing to set up, no equipment, just, just get in the storm and just, you know, uh, just like, you know, just get in the storm and just like experience it. You know, there's uh there's something like really cool about that. Um, and, uh, and I kind of miss that a little bit, but I, I get so much pleasure from documenting storms now and just being in them that I think, um, or, or, you know, recording them that I think it, it makes up for it, but I miss that. And interestingly, when I started chasing, 
I didn't know that there was such a thing as storm chasing. Again, this was before the internet. This was before, uh, you know, this was before like, uh, before the movie Twister. There, there was literally, I, I, don't, I don't remember being aware that there was this thing called storm chasing. I just remember I wanted to be in a hurricane. Uh, can you watch Hurricane Man on YouTube? Thanks for asking, Maria. Uh, it's not on YouTube, but it is on, if you're in the United States, you can get it on Amazon Prime. Uh, you just go on Amazon and and, go, and just type like Hurricane Man and all of season one should come up. Cool Gamer wants to know, how strong were the storms in New York when I was little? So I was in two. I was, I was a toddler. The very first one I was like, I was a toddler, which was Hurricane Bell in 1976. I don't even remember the storm because it hit in the middle of the night and I was sleeping. But what I remember is I woke up the next day and, and just what a mess everything was. That was, it was a category one that hit Long Island. The eye passed right over my town and it just, I, I just couldn't believe what a mess the, 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 the town was just trees and branches. It just like, whoa. And I was, I asked my dad, like, what happened? You know, what's a hurricane? And that, that started, that started my obsession was that hurricane. And then it cut to a decade later, 1985, I was a 15 year old, really hardcore, serious weather nerd. Like if there was Twitter back then, I'm sure I would have driven all of the chasers crazy. <laughs> like I would have been one of those. Um, but there wasn't social media back then. I was just a little nerd who like would occasionally get things, uh, you know, mailed from the national hurricane center. But I was 15 and this hurricane approached this big ass category four approach the East coast and then shot up right to long Island. The I pass right over my town. That was hurricane Gloria that hit as a category one, like an 85 mile an hour category one. But that was that was very exciting for me because I was, you know, this big hurricane nerd and a hurricane came to me, but they were both category ones. Uh, New York has not had a major since 1954, since Carol hit Long Island. Yeah, I see some other people remember Gloria as well. Sam asked, are there specific untapped dream chase setup locations for you? Um, yeah, you know, I always have a fantasy about being like on a, you know, or, or some kind of reinforced building on stilts right on the coast in like a category nine. The problem is the way I chase is I'm really, I'm, I'm constantly adjusting my position. I'm really neurotic about getting, I really want to get in the eye or at least the eye wall. And it means I'm just like till the very end, I'm adjusting my position. So with that kind of chasing, I, I can't fall in love with any location. If I find it like a the perfect, wow, seaside resort, amazing view, this is going to be unbelievable footage. Every time that happens, the hurricane turns or goes somewhere else. And then you have that temptation to stay because you just, you love the environment. Oh, wow, what a cool resort this is. This will make really good footage. But I have to tell myself, no, okay? It's not about whether the location is pretty or scenic or right on the ocean for me, what matters is, am I going to be in the core of the hurricane? And if I feel like I'm not going to be, then I got to move. And I think a good example of that was uh, hurricane Michael. Okay. I was in Panama city waiting for the storm and I'm watching it on radar. I was in a hotel in Panama city and I thought, Oh, this will be like a good spot. You know, we're in this hotel. There's lots of people. It'll there's trees all around. It'll be very interesting footage. Well, it started to veer and I just thought, okay, that was another chase where I knew this was going to be a big historic storm and I need to like, I need to really do a good job with this one. And I was so like, oh, I don't want to get in the car. I didn't want to leave the hotel. I just wanted to stay. I call it chaser dude inertia where you're just comfortable in your location. But I'm like, no, I have to fight that. And on every chase, I've got to fight that, what I call the chaser dude inertia. And I got to just keep going, keep going, keep going until you get in that eye. And so with Michael, just right before the eye wall hit, uh, my I was I was we were filming Hurricane Man, so I had a couple crew members with me. At, right before the inner core hit, we relocated four miles to the east, and thank God we did because by relocating to Callaway, four miles to the east southeast, we got in the eye, which I really wanted to do. I wanted to get that pressure reading in the eye, so. I made that conquest because I fought the inertia because I just said, no, I'm not going to get comfortable here. I'm going to keep going, keep going. So I try not to get too obsessed with the, uh, I try not to get too obsessed with the, with the, you know, how cool the location is. It's just about getting in the storm. Okay. Question from KV gaming. When a hurricane comes from another country, then what do you do? I'm actually not sure. 
I'm actually not sure I understand the question. Um, I chase hurricanes all over the world in any countries that I'm allowed to answer or, or to enter. So I guess that's my answer to that. Um, hey, Julie, nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Yeah, I decided to just keep going. Uh, we're two hours, but people are still asking questions. So, hey, it's not going to hurt anyone. Okay, Hurricane Sandy, I did not chase. So Hurricane Sandy was a, a cataclysmic event, uh, devastating for New York and New Jersey with that huge storm surge, but it wasn't my kind of storm. So Sandy was transitioning to an extra tropical storm. And actually when it actually made landfall, it was not even a hurricane. It no longer had an eye wall or a core. And that's what makes me excited. Like I, I know I sound like a total weirdo, but I'm really into the structures of hurricanes and that's what I'm into. And Sandy didn't have those components, so I didn't chase it. A side of me regrets it just because the human impact was so huge. It was obviously like a very big, important event. A side of me was like, yeah, maybe I should have covered it. But um, generally, even though it was a huge event, it wasn't, it wasn't my kind of event. Connor, Worldwide Weather asks, am I going to stream more often? Uh, I'm going to stream like this. I'm going to do a regular show like this called I cyclone live. I'm going to do this. Now, folks ask me a lot about live streaming while I'm chasing, and I'm going to say probably not. And the reason is I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I I know when I'm watching hurricane videos, I want the dude or the gal who shot it to, to curate it, to pick the really cool parts. Like, show me the best. Show me the best stuff you got. I'm not into watching like two hours of footage. And also, as I chase a hurricane, you know, there's like almost like a storytelling process. I want to kind of feed the experience to you guys at home. And that's why I like tweeting clips because I like to shoot a bunch of clips and then look at, okay, which are the really cool ones? Uh, you know, which are the ones that are like, which are the clips are, that are really going to give you a flavor for this? And I feel that for, for the viewers, it makes a more exciting experience if they're getting curated content, they're getting the coolest moments rather than just like two hours of just stuff. So I'm probably, I'm, I have no plans to be live streaming uh, on uh, on chases. I think that's probably unlikely. Uh, Bad Weather Freak, thank you very much. I appreciate that, man. Uh, I, I the, the pressure data that I collected in that and what, and what I saw in it in terms of like gradients and stuff, I was very excited about it. And uh, I'm glad that you enjoyed that. I assume you saw my paper about it. In case you didn't go to icyclone.com, go to the chases page go to the Dorian page and you'll see an orange button for a downloadable report. If you really want to nerd out, you could really see a very, uh, a very sort of detailed discussion of the data and uh, it, it gets pretty deep and pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. What's my favorite country or state where I have chased storms? Well, I would, <laughs> maybe Mississippi. I mean, Mississippi has really grown on me. I really, I, I love the Mississippi coast and I love Bay St. Louis. So there's that. Uh, I love Taiwan. Uh, like, as I mentioned, Taiwan's a great place. I love the Philippines. I mean, people are really friendly and open in the Philippines. Uh, I like chasing in Texas. You know, actually, I'm one of these guys. I'm happy anywhere. I, there, there's very few places I don't like to go, to be honest. I, I enjoy most places. I would say some places are, are I prefer to chase more than others. I will say this. I don't like chasing in Louisiana. I love Louisiana. I mean, it's, it's like a really cool state, but chasing there is hard because, because it's all that flat swamp land. It's hard to, and they're really intense hurricanes. It's, it's kind of hard to get close to the coast. So you have to be inland. I, I find Louisiana very, very challenging. Like Texas is a lot easier. Um, and I, and I get more excited to chase in Texas than Louisiana. Lois asks, what's the worst part of a chase? Um, yeah, great question. And I could, I have a very, uh, I, I have a, a very specific answer. I would say it's the part, it's the hours before I hit the bullseye. It's those final hours before impact when the hurricane's just offshore and it's kind of the moment of truth. Okay, I'm making the final decisions about where I'm going to be, and those decisions are going to dictate whether I am successful or not. And and I. I because I put a lot of pressure on myself that can get really, that can, that, that pressure can really get to me and it can really, um, you know, again, I don't talk about this on Twitter. I'm kind of like old school. I'm one of those guys who doesn't talk about emotions, but, uh, that, that pressure can get, you know, it, it can be a lot sometimes. And it's, it added to my burnout last year, you know, just, uh, that, that feeling of dread, uh, in the final hours, you know, am I gonna, am I gonna get in the eye or am I gonna mess this up? You know, um, I would say that's uh, 
that's uh, that's something that I live with. Uh, Throby asked if I chased Typhoon Goni last year, and, and yes, someone else answered for him, but no, I didn't because of COVID. Uh, you couldn't enter the Philippines last year. I certainly would have chased it. That thing was a strong, long track typhoon, meaning you knew days in advance that it was going to be a big impact. So yeah, I totally would have gone for that. You know, COVID denied me that experience, but you know, COVID gave me other things. You know, I made lemonade with those lemons. Uh, Bad Weather Freak asks, what are my thoughts about Florida and the Caribbean? You know, it's a great question. A lot of folks want to know, you know, okay, where are the hurricanes going to cluster? After every season, we see very, in most seasons, we see very clear clusters. Last year was a Gulf season. Uh, the 1950s was an East Coast decade. Everything went up the East Coast. My mother grew up in New York in the 19, she was a teenager in the 1950s. She remembers hurricane after hurricane because the 1950s was just East Coast. Uh, but it's hard to say beforehand how those patterns are going to set up. So, uh, and, and basically every time I see predictions, okay, this part of the country or this part of the basin is going to get more, it always seems to me like it's total voodoo. So I'm not going to make any guesses. I'm not going to do that. Oh, someone has a very good question. Um, Toby asks, what, what do I think was the worst part of Hurricane Harvey, the flooding or the eye wall? Well, it's a great question. So the eye wall was intense and violent and scary, but it actually affected relatively few people. That's where I was. I was in Rockport and those towns like Rockport, Aransas Pass, Port Aransas got absolutely smashed by that thing. And that was an intense hurricane. But what, what impacted a lot more people, millions and millions and millions of people, of course, was the flooding in Houston, the Houston Metroplex. And the storm was just a week. It was a weak tropical storm by that point. So that's what made the national headlines. That's what everyone was talking about. But their, their really violent impact was, was those small towns. And one thing that concerned me after was that I felt like everyone forgot the initial impact and all everyone was talking about was the rain in Houston. So in terms of like dollar damage and about number of people affected, certainly the, the flooding portion of Harvey, that's what people I guess are going to remember. But me as a chaser, I remember that category four impact in Rockport and uh, Aransas Pass and Port Aransas. That was that thing was a rough hurricane. That was a serious deal. Two thousand seventeen was a very busy season. Uh, the highlights include or I should say the lowlights was Hurricane Harvey category four in Texas that uh, then caused catastrophic flooding in the Houston area. Then there was Hurricane Irma, which blasted a bunch of Caribbean islands as a full on cat five and Cuba as a cat five, then hit the Florida Keys as a cat four and the West coast of Florida as a cat three. And then the devastating Hurricane Maria, the worst hurricane to hit Puerto Rico, the U S territory in almost a century. So that was 2017. What was interesting about 2017 was that it was the worst hurricane uh, season in over a decade. It was really kind of a surprise. Yeah. All right, folks, uh, trying to think um, if there's any last calls, any final, final uh, questions, I could try to address them. But otherwise, it looks like we're, we're sort of winding down here. Yeah, we went over. Wow, we went over two hours. I, I had too much fun, I guess. I don't, I, I don't remember all that. I, don't, I didn't. I didn't feel like we were talking that long. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's like a party it just flies by. All right, folks. Um, I uh, I really uh, appreciate uh, all you guys coming and attending this. It's been a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed this way of interacting. It was a lot different than Twitter. You know, I feel like more like we were kind of talking, and that that's really cool. Uh, I'll schedule an another one of these real soon. In the meantime, please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't, so that you'll be alerted to future live streams. And yeah, and uh, follow me of course on Twitter or Facebook. I Cyclone. That concludes iCyclone Live episode number one. Have an awesome day, guys. Take care. I will see you soon. <laughs>